Welcome to Haunt Topic Radio, the podcast for haunters by haunters. These are our scary visions. What makes a great haunt? Is it the outside? Is it the inside? Is it the actors? The marketing? What makes a great haunt? Well, in this podcast episode, you're going to find out. We talked to Tyler and Nora Prophet from the Scare Factor review team. They've been through enough haunts to see many things that others don't have time to see. I know there's this big thing around scare teams and how they review and if they're any good. We address that in this podcast episode as well. We are also looking for Haunter's Toolbox mentors and vendors so if you would like to teach a class if you would like to be a mentor for our group members of the haunters toolbox and if you are a vendor that sells haunt related products of any type we're looking for partners if you're listening to this email me brian b-r-i-a-n at scaryvisions.com i will send you more information we hope you had a great october Many people are gearing up for their actor parties. That's what we always did. We had a Thanksgiving party in November. And that's where we handed out our scare badges and fed everybody. And we had prizes and games and fun, fun stuff. And gearing up for that haunt season 2024. It'll be here before you know it. Well, if you're a home haunter, a haunt owner, a designer, an actor, and you're trying to make the haunted attraction that you're at great, then keep on listening. Welcome, everybody. We're going to start letting people in here. Man. Greetings. We got Bob. We got, so we got Jim, Kimberly, Bob, Joanna. Hello, hello. Hello. Christopher. One of my, somebody disappeared on me. Um, <laughs> ask you guys to keep yourself muted. Cameras, cameras, and mics. So we keep things clean. So we're not over talking each other. Sometimes we'll let the, at the end of the conversation, if we have some time, we'll let you guys hop in. If you have any questions, this is Scare Factor tonight. We're going to be talking about how to make your haunt great. These guys have been through, I don't know how many haunts. We'll get into that in a minute. But um, Scare Factor review team, scarefactor.com. They know haunts inside and out. I know there's a big thing about review teams, and we'll cover that as we go along. Um, Let me put Dane in there. So ask your questions in the chat room. Uh, We will be monitoring the chat. I got some questions as well, so we'll uh, we'll get into those. And once again, if you're a Haunt Master member, you will get a recording of this. If you want to be a Haunt Master, go over to HauntersToolbox.com. So tonight, Tyler, Nora, Profit. That's how you say your last name, right? Yeah, yeah. Profit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. From ScareFactor.com. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that know you. Um, there's you probably been to a lot of these people's haunts that are in the chat room. If not, I know Dan's been trying to get somebody to come to his haunt, so. Maybe we can uh, talk about that in a little bit. So tell us about Scare Factor. Yeah. So thanks for having us on. We're super excited. Uh, so yeah, Scare Factor uh, got its start as a review website. Um, and actually, we're not the original owners of it. It was actually founded by a haunt owner, and he's the one that came up with the original criteria. So uh, we've tried to adhere to those values because we we believe in them. And, uh, you know, we tweak and modify as, uh, you know, the times progress and things change and new trends start coming out, that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, we've uh, we added in the directory. So we try to list all haunted attractions that we can find, no matter how big or small. Uh, home haunts to screen parks, doesn't matter, theme parks, all of them. And uh, we try to apply the rating system to all of them so that uh, everybody can kind of get an apples to apples comparison uh, Mm-hmm. when they're picking a haunt to go to. So and when we first started, we had, um, I think we were one of three or four teams, I believe. And then uh, after we took over in 2013, uh, we've scaled up to this year, I believe we're at 28 teams, mm-hmm. somewhere in there. Yeah, so, and we're coast to coast, hitting as many haunts as we can. <laughs> Do you guys cover across the Europe, anything over there yet? Or we're, is that... We're, we're not across the big water yet, but we're not uh, reviews. We do have yeah. some in the directory. They're kind of hard, harder to find though. 
Yeah. Um, so if you know one that we're missing, let us know because we do add them. But um, Canada is kind of the same way. We have some there, too, but I know we're missing a bunch. Right. We had a Canada team for mm -hmm. a couple of years, but she uh, moved on to bigger and better things. So, <laughs> so if you're out there listening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we got our nose to the ground welcoming applications from just about anywhere that we don't already have coverage for. So, <laughs> yes, we usually get a bunch of applications where we already are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how many um, haunts are on this website now? How many haunts are on the website? I could uh, we're somewhere in the ballpark of twenty four to twenty five hundred mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Haunted attractions only. Yeah, yeah, we're currently moving, removing, adding, removing, adding, removing, adding. So usually floats see, around somewhere mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Do you see uh, an area where there are a lot more haunts? The, the Midwest. Mid the Midwest. <laughs> Midwest. For sure. Way more. Anywhere fun. east of the Mississippi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like Ohio up there has a lot. Yeah. Michigan. Ohio has as many as the state of California, and you you can you know. Yeah. California is much larger than Those Ohio. Those two are always going back and forth. Yeah, Indiana, <laughs> Ohio, Kentucky, uh, Illinois is not quite as many. Obviously, there's a bunch up around Chicago, but Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And then if you take all of New England, there's a bunch up there too. But yeah, basically east of the Mississippi. Like once you go west, like things start getting real sparse out until you hit like some big major cities and things. But then once you hit California, of course, there's a bazillion over there too. But mm -hmm. yeah. For the so most why, part, they're all around the Midwest. But so, why do haunt reviewers get a bad rap? Let's get that out of the way. What there's a, there's a lot of different do? reasons, I believe, and some of them may even be be because of us. <laughs> I mean, we all kind of start somewhere. So we've been reviewing since 2010, and as a haunt reviewer, um, you kind of gotta learn how to do it. I know that's. <laughs> probably pretty hard for people to be like, well, how do you learn how to do that? Well, you go to them and you visit and you work with the owners. And when I say work with them, as in you communicate with them and you go, okay, so your vortex tunnel wasn't working. Why wasn't it working? And they're like, well, the fire marshal said I couldn't run it tonight because I didn't spray it in time and it wasn't dry or whatever the thing may be. So we are learning attractions from the outside looking in, but we also need to know how they run and what it takes to run them. So in 2010, we started out as, I would say, a regular customer. Yes, we love going to haunted houses. We visit about 20 a year. We think we should start reviewing these because we see so many. And then after that, we started going like and seeing behind the scenes stuff. And haunts are okay with inviting us to things like that. And we go to things like Transworld and MHC. And we really start learning more about the industry itself rather than just the haunts. Well, and like for Transworld, for example, the reason we started going to that was because owners were like, OK, you gave me a score of this. How can I improve it? Mm -hmm. And we thought, OK, well, who are we to tell these guys how to improve something if we don't know like the tools and the props and things that they have available to them or like how much they cost and that sort of thing. So uh, aside from networking, Transworld is a way for us to stay abreast of all the things that is available yes. to the industry, you know. So over the years, we have gotten to be a lot better reviewers. We'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> a lot of people want to know who credits the reviewers or how do you, how do you say you're a reviewer? Well, any somebody commented on a post that was on Facebook and kind of nailed it on the head with their answer of anybody that walks through a haunted house can be a reviewer as they're the ones that did experience that haunted house without any ties to it. So, and, and that is correct, but there are different types of reviewers too. So like you've got some of your folks like us who spend a lot of time trying to learn as much as we can about the industry, but still write our reviews based on that customer experience. But then you also have some that are mad actors. And they're like, well, I'm just going to go become a haunt reviewer next year. And this haunted house pissed me off. And I'm going to go give them a two. And I'm going to score everybody else a nine. Mm -hmm. um, you have those. I think those are the ones where most reviewers get a bad rap. <laughs> they, they don't have I mean, a defined criteria system. You know, they're, they got a chip on their shoulder for some reason or... Or they're they're very inconsistent with their scores and, and the things they review on that sort of thing. And I think in uh, in plus you just have like you say Joe Blow regular public that says, well, I'm going to be a haunt reviewer because they get to go in and get free tickets and do this and do that, and that's what I want. And you know they think if they just wave the reviewer flag and make a Facebook page, they can do it. And unfortunately, some haunts let them. <laughs> you know, so I mean, to, to some extent, there's the haunts owe it to themselves to do a little due diligence and, you know, make sure that they are allowing. Uh, and, and I'm not saying don't allow brand new review teams if you feel like they're, you know, like say everybody started somewhere. Mm -hmm. But if 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 they're going to 
if, if you're going to risk them giving you, you know, a negative review or a review that you think is not what you deserve, I mean, you, you, you kind of asked for it if you're sticking mm-hmm. your neck out there for That's them. That's probably you know? right there is the, I mean, the majority of the reasons to why people don't like reviewers. Someone has come through and either told them something they didn't like, they didn't agree with, they didn't want to own up to that, the fact that maybe they didn't score as high as they should. And they're, to me, they're looking at it the wrong way. And although it's really hard to say this not being a hot owner, um, it is a score, but the reason we use the scores is because it shows you how to improve and where you are. So as a reviewer, it's really, we're just trying to help, but it doesn't mm-hmm. seem that way sometimes. And we have given haunts a score of a nine and a half that have gotten really upset with us and don't want us back. And we have given scores of a six and the haunt owners were really happy about it and wanted us back every year because they wanted to use what we were saying to help them improve. Like they knew that we were going to a lot of haunts, a lot of haunts in the area. And they knew that what we were seeing at other places, you know, we could compare them to that and kind of say, well, you guys were all saying get out, but did you know that you can say things besides that? Uh, These guys are doing that and it works well. These, you know, all the way down to simple things like that. So we get a bad rap usually because we've just made somebody mad for whatever reason. But like I said, sometimes it is our fault. So like Tyler and I, out of 28 teams, uh, we're the ones that are banned from the most haunts ourselves, me and him directly. Um, True. <laughs> we were banned from one because they said they don't support haunt reviewers. And we knew that going into the attraction. Like we knew that they were known to not like reviewers. However, our customers kept asking us to review this attraction. And it's attraction that we personally really like. Mm-hmm. So we decided to try it. We went up there and we... So for all of you that say we should just show up, buy our tickets, not announce ourselves, we did that. Mm -hmm. And um, we wrote the review. It was, I think, a score of an 825. And if you want to understand these crazy scores and how we get these decimal points, I don't know if we have enough time tonight, but we can Mm -hmm. show you why. It's all on a score sheet and we don't pick those numbers. It's actual math. Mm-hmm. So, like so we have to put a number on the card, but after that, it's all math. And it, you yeah, know, we, yeah, it's to keep us as unbiased as possible. We, we, we can't give you three eights and your overall is a nine, you know? <laughs> we, we, so we get to this haunt and we write the review and it's like an 8.25. And they are really upset because they had asked all reviewers not to review and we had done it anyway. But we went through, we paid as customers and we wrote them a fair review in which other people that had been that year had also looked at it and thought that it was a very fair review. And it so, wasn't negative. We said, hey, if you we make, said, make was, sure to go yeah. visit this haunt, this haunt season. And that's you know. another thing, too. As a reviewer, you kind of learn how to say things. So mm-hmm. I'm not saying not to let in a new reviewer. If you will look at our website and at our reviewers, we do have their experience level from us put on there. So if you have a team come through that's only doing it in their first year, they may not know as much about the industry as we do so like if tyler and i go through your attraction and 90 percent of your actors are doing everything to a t we're going to say the majority of these cast members had great dialogue they were doing what they were doing long story short if we go through and only 10 percent of them are we're probably going to say something along the lines of a few of your actors were doing what they were supposed to be doing (laughs) the rest of them were not but we will leave that part out because we try to keep that negative out of there so you gotta like read between the lines (laughs) Over the years, we learned not to say certain things. And yes, you may read our reviews and think they all seem very positive. But if you really read enough of them, you would understand like exactly where we're all coming from. And the more we write, the better we get at doing that. Mm -hmm. And the general customer may not really care. Like they may not care about the generator being so loud that we couldn't hear the cast members. They may not care to read that. They just want to know if they're going to go and get scared there or what they might see. So we try not to do too much of that. But um, we let's see as reviewers I'm gonna keep talking about this for a minute sorry <laughs> uh, we get accused of mixing haunts up that could be possible um, we do audio record at the majority that we go to to help we with that encourage our team um, to we to. do encourage our the teams to do as well the reason being is sometimes we're going to up to four haunts a night like four different locations and once you go through there you may forget exactly which haunt you saw the scarecrow in I mean it it happens it's like you human error. Um, So I'm not going to say that that doesn't happen, but we're also open to criticism as well. So like if our team came through or even us as the team and you didn't like what we said, or you think we, we mixed you up with the haunt down the road, come to us and tell us about it. (laughs) Like we're, we will work with them. We'll work with you. We will try to figure it out. Um, It could simply be something that's misunderstood. 
Mm -hmm. um, we've had a haunt that was really upset that we mentioned in the review multiple times that they were child friendly. And the male haunt owner did not appreciate that. But the female haunt owner had it's actually that's on our sign. it. Yes. It's on our sign, honey. Yes, we're family friendly. And he's like, oh. <laughs> so he was super mad at us for basically saying his haunt wasn't scary. And that's not what we were trying to do at all. We were trying to kind of use their own signs to describe how or what type of attraction it was. And it probably would be scary to those that are, you know, younger, smaller, or younger. Yeah. Out, yeah. So family, friend, think, family friendly. Yes. Yes. And that doesn't mean it's not necessarily scary. It just means it, and it doesn't mean those of us that go to a lot of places, it may not be. And it but, doesn't mean the haunt's bad because like, that's another reason why we try to review all haunts in a positive light because just because you didn't score as well as this haunt down the road doesn't mean you're not perfect for somebody that's just starting out or isn't looking for something as scary you know so we just try to be as accurate as we feel we can be and that's all we can do you know mm -hmm. so you just try so, get better <laughs> so going back to the let's go back to what makes a haunt great when you guys are researching a haunt are you getting ready to go to a haunt I'm sure you probably look at their website, probably look at their social media stuff, their marketing. So mm -hmm. take us through your procedure of investigating a haunt. Pick one out. What makes a haunt great from where you start to when you leave in your car and drive away? Paint us, a, paint us a picture. Sure, sure. So it, it really does start at, you know, how, how do we locate you on the interwebs? You know, we get we got to know that you're a thing first you know so we start off by going to the scarefactor.com you know? <laughs> we, go to, we, we go to google and hey you guys have felt when i ran the dead factory you guys helped us out great because you had that the contest you know we won like eighth and then third and then so we put that everywhere and mm -hmm. yes it's fan base but i in my marketing i put van fan voted best haunt missouri three you know number three in missouri so that did help <laughs> us in our marketing yeah, uh, awesome. just putting up just putting a little logo on there <laughs> and the review that you guys did when you walk through we got like there's like eight point something i think our score jumped up a little bit next year but we took what you uh mentioned and then we revamped stuff and changed things and made it better so but go ahead i just wanted to add that before i forgot I think Scarret Badges are one of the smartest things I've seen in the industry in a really long time. Scarret Badges are basically either pins or embroidered patches, uh, kind of like Merit Badges, as they are you know, somewhat named after, from Boy Scouts and, and Girl Scouts and Brownies, and where after you've accomplished something, you can wear the brag tag of the embroidered patch. Some haunts put them on jackets, some put them on t-shirts, some put them on uh, with the pins. I've seen them put them on lanyards. But the neat thing about them is they are very specific in what they are rewarding. And they're haunt-based images that reflect what's being rewarded. It's retention, it is bringing people back, and it's actually giving your haunters, your haunt performers, the ability to share that they are haunt performers. And, oh really, you're a, you're a scare actor. Where do you do that? And then they will insert the name of your haunt right there. So it's also marketing. I've always been a big fan of Scarret Badges. I think they're great. So check them out, scarretbadges.com. No, it is, that is not a paid advertisement. That is just my recommendation. I think it's really cool. ScottSwinson.com Right, Thank right. You. So uh, I will say that we actually do use our website to figure out like okay. geographically where the haunts are and like, okay, these two we can pair together. And then after that, we start digging in and we start looking for dates. We start looking for hours and that's FAQ. been FAQ pages. Like, are, is it indoor? Is it outdoor? Is it a touch haunt? Like how many attractions do they have? How long is it going to take us to get through here? Like actually, um, and we found out that most times when a haunt owner or a website, something says it's going to take about 30 to 40 minutes, we can almost guarantee it's going to be about 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> it's usually about half. It's Not about always, half. but it is oftentimes about half. And we don't walk fast. We're pretty slow, actually. <laughs> Just comparing so, like our reviews and like what our teams actually stopwatch time it at versus like what it says on the watch but it usually ends right. up being an hour and a half right <laughs> yeah okay so that's 45 minutes yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> having accurate but, information on your website is definitely a good place to start to be great okay, yeah. check okay accurate yeah, information. Check mm -hmm. it's gotta be it's gotta be consistent google facebook instagram mm -hmm. yes. everything's gotta be the same thing 
I was just getting ready to say Facebook. Yeah, there Facebook are some out there right the... now that have bad website links on their Facebook. I found them yesterday. Mm -hmm. So get on there and update all your links. People can't buy tickets if your ticketing link is last year's mm -hmm. or, you know, if you sometimes have... we have the wrong ones, but you got to tell us. Right. Hey, update this. Mm -hmm. When do when do you think haunts should start changing? Should they be proactively doing this all season? Do you see like November? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I November. would start changing it as soon as as soon as you can, because. Google caches, you know, all your pages and stuff. So when your customer goes in and says, scariest haunted house in Missouri and starts looking on Google, if you have your 2023 information on there in November or whatnot, it's going to start caching that Google, sooner. Google takes about three to six months, mm -hmm. depending on how much traffic you get to really start indexing and ranking your pages for what they're supposed to. And if it's crawling your schedule page and seeing 2022 everywhere, it's going to think either A, you're not open or B, you're not going to be open for this year. Like it, it still thinks you're stuck in the past. Like, so literally like January, February, whenever you're doing your team meetings and figuring out, okay, what days are we going to be open? Like, as soon as you figure that out, post, like get it out there as quick as humanly possible. Because... There's um probably Joanna's in the chat. She can probably confirm with me. There's probably 20% or more of haunts right now that do not have their 2023 dates out anywhere. Um, yeah. It might, it might be more. So it's, Get that information out there. Like if you're want, uh, think of it as a movie. Like when uh, your Halloween movie for the next season's coming out, when do they start talking about that? When can you find information on that? Like get that stuff out there. And those FAQs that we mentioned, those are super, super important. Tyler and I will actually score on whether there's an FAQ. It's a question under our customer service. We really, really want to know answers to like the indoor outdoor because if it's going to rain, then I know I probably shouldn't go that night. And if you're so many things. if you shut down for rain you know what, what's your rain or shine policy you know um what's your parking look like mm -hmm. do i need to bring cash for parking mm -hmm. um but yeah we we that is something we score on is how much information about your haunt can we find before we get there great websites uh, also have a lot of media on there so your mm -hmm. promo videos not from 2021 or 2020 please at least update the dates on those so customers aren't like i don't want to watch that that's old mm. like update that information, get some pictures of your really good characters on there. And most importantly, please use your own. Don't put pictures <laughs> of stuff on there that you do not have in your attraction. Accurate information. Mm -hmm. you, just because it's on Google doesn't mean you can use it. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah maybe a little all... direction, a little Google map, a little plugin. Mm -hmm. so right. Yeah, that's a good idea. And... Mm -hmm. Especially if you have special instructions, because a lot of places do. Tyler and I have driven in circles many times mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah we, we'll research the haunt we'll figure out what their dates and hours are we'll get them on our schedule and then usually we'll reach out to lock them in you know figure out a date that sort of thing um but after that so i do want to take a little so the immersion and, and all that stuff starts as soon as we get in the parking lot so like number one can we find your signs can we tell where to park easily you know or could we find that on the website that sort of thing like it, it needs to be pretty brainless to, uh, to be able to find the place and get parked. Um, if you're off in somebody's field and you don't have pretty nice uh, and ideally themed signage out by the road, um, then that can be a pain if you don't have that. Um, but like, like I said, I was wanting to back up just a little bit. We, something else that we've gone to enough haunts that we can kind of tell too is some of this, some of the the ambience and in the the vibe and just what makes a haunt great. Uh, it, it's not any one thing so like uh, it, it's it's a lot of boxes that have to get checked and they have to be done exceptionally well to get into that great status mm -hmm. and a lot of that starts from you know the top and you know shit rolls downhill it starts with management as a foundation you know if, if you're just in it for money or if you're just doing this you know trying to make a quick buck we can tell that as customers because you're you're cutting corners on this your staff feel like you just kick their dog you know and we we get that feeling as customers mm -hmm. if, if people aren't doing it for the right reason you can feel yeah. the love and the passion people put into it you can absolutely yes sure. and the vibe from the actors through the show is much different in, in so, those situations. So have a clear hierarchy. Um, so like have enough managers to be able to take care of things that need done without having so many that like nobody's staying busy or nobody knows, you know, do I talk to this person today? Do I talk to that person? Like, you know, have a good, clear, strong hierarchy of management that makes things a whole lot easier, especially for us, even as reviewers or the customer come into a haunt. Like our first point of contact is the ticket booth. So like not only do those people need to be like super friendly and, you know, professional and accommodating and knowledgeable, like 
like if we need to get a hold of somebody to do a, you know, we scheduled a behind the scenes tour or something, they got to know exactly who to call. And, you know, there's, there's a process for things and, you know, we can, we can tell when, you know, Don't things make like it that are the owner are that gets contacted all the time. Right. We've right. seen quite a few that actually run that way. Um, Some folks need a, a manager or two to, to help, you know, delegate and take that load off. And the, the gears turn easier when, when there's, <laughs> and there's more grease and you know and, oh yeah, yeah. Not, sure, not sure what i'm trying to say there but yeah yeah we um, have what well we had um i was a co-owner and i owned the debt fac- factory and so we had i was in the house managing um q line <clears throat> actor area visible take care of stuff and then the other owner was in the ticket booth, so he ran so he was there the whole time so and mm-hmm, it kind of mm-hmm. and it kind of lets because he picks up on customers that I didn't pick up on. So, and then our Q line actors pick up on customers that may have an issue, you know, they're drunk mm-hmm. or they're causing verbal, you just know they're going to be buttheads, right? So, right. So I got my Q line actors, I got me looking. If I can't be there, he, the ticket booth guys watching, making sure stuff's going on. So, but yeah, that's a, uh, it's good to have people, eyes, friendly, customer service, accommodating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And just a couple more points on ticket booth too. If you have the the real estate or the buildings to be able to handle, you know, multiple ticket lines for like your online sales versus on site sales, definitely recommend doing that because uh, you know if folks have already paid you money buying tickets on site, you know, go ahead and try to take care of them and let them get into the haunt as quickly as possible. Taking people's money and getting them into the haunt should be the quickest and easiest parts of running mm-hmm. the business. You know, in my opinion, get them in the door you know, get their money as quick as possible. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you upset those customers yeah. out there, they're, they're going to lost a lot. Really, yeah. <laughs> yeah their car. Like, there they go. Tell lights. Oh, well, they're $100. Thanks. Yep. Or they decide to stand in line because their friend made them and then they're mad all the way through the haunt and then they leave a bad review because they're mad about something else and it didn't really have anything to do with the inside. We've so. had stories of that just with us, even as experience, you know, and then we understand, you know, there, you know, the house takes breaks and things like that, which I don't understand why you need to take a, 45 minute break when you have 3,000 people in line, but it's okay. Yeah. Now, what we did on what we did with our actors was if it was a slow night, we could pause the show because we only had, you know, 10, 15 people starting to walk in. Okay. You guys get 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So they want to let the queue line build up. Queue line builds up. Everybody gets them back in their house, their spots. And they, we kind of staggered them because, you know, if you're the mainline actor, and that haunt takes 25 minutes to get through, you know, you at least have 25 minutes to your, to the end room. So this zone would go, then this zone would go. And then it took, it, it took some finessing because you have to be on these actors that are talking and smoking cigarettes, you know, they're chit chatting like, okay, zone two, you got two minutes, you got two minutes Thank to get back. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of a stagger sometimes. And sometimes we didn't have that option and it's uh we send relief actors in. So the relief relief actors go in, cover a zone, and then relieve zones as they go through. So everybody gets a spot. Some actors want to take a take a break. Some actors, no, I'm good. You just go to the next one, just make sure everyone has the opportunity to get a rest, go bathroom, whatever. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. and then one last thing about ticket booth is if you are doing online tickets and you're just like a scan and go scan and go type of thing i don't know if you're giving wristbands or what but if we have the option to have a like a paper nice printout souvenir ticket we will take it because mm-hmm. we want that souvenir you know a lot so, of that, yeah. that. But, mm-hmm. i mean it's just something extra that somebody gets to take home and like i don't know if you can see kind of in the corner over here but our whole entire oh. wall is full of pictures yeah. and tickets and ticket stubs on like we, literally a whole wall of our thing is all ticket things and pictures and souvenir yeah, photos you, lately people it. have been giving us really decorated tickets and they rip them in half and instead of letting They're us like, keep the second half it? it's <laughs> like for the second haunt and then they take it until you can't have it because they're using that as their we know you can't get back in here but right we like to keep them let us yeah. keep our your tickets you know? <laughs> notice that because i was uh, i was making dead factory like uh free tickets that's the only print printed ticket that we had was the free tickets and then we'd use wristband. Well, then we found that people are wanting to keep those tickets. Mm-hmm. So it mm-hmm. makes sense because people want to hang on to the souvenir. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And you can probably else. put a coupon on there for next year or something along those lines. It's something right. else to remember the haunt by. And that's kind of what this whole 
topic is about is what makes a good haunt great you know a great you know the the definition of that is going to be relative for everybody you know something that you know somebody that never goes to haunted houses or just goes to you know one every two three years is going to think any haunts that they go to and are enjoying and have a good time they're all great you know but to somebody like us that you know i think we've got close to 50 haunts slated on our yeah, schedule for this year us. there's there's a little bit higher bar for the word great you know <laughs> they're like we think all haunts are good and fun mm-hmm. but there's there's a different tier on great and like uh my mind just went blank where was was we well, has there, has there ever been a haunt that's got 10 out of 10? No. No, there has okay. never been a haunt that gets no, full 10s across the board. No, we have given the score. So if you've ever looked at our score sheets, there's like 40-some questions that get scored. There have been a, Okay, wait, we took it way down. We, we took a, we took a category. We, we merged two categories, okay. and we played with some. We're down to just under 30 bullet points that each gets its own score. Um, We have given 10s a few times in those. It's generally the customer service category. Mm-hmm. Um, That's, that's being, the being, easiest one to excel at, really. Being friendly and professional is is free, you know, mm-hmm. and that, that should yeah. be easy to get a but, 10 on. But not everybody does that, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it takes, takes just as much, the same amount of energy to be nice, mm-hmm. say, you know, so. Yeah, okay, so we're at the ticket um, booth. You got your souvenir ticket. Then what? Now is when uh, kind of the atmosphere and the immersion starts to kick in. And this is where we start getting introduced to, like, say, your storyline, if you have one. Like, uh, if you go to, you know, Disney or Universal and you enter a a different area, you kind of know what the vibe is or what the theme is in that area. Like, if you're going back into the Harry Potter section, you're going to see the pointy roofs and things are decorated and the dragon on the bank and all that. So, you know, just being standing in one spot and looking around you can tell where you're at and what the story is we want to make sure we're not buying tickets to just the mall and when we walk into the mall we see a facade to a haunted house and we're like ah we're getting ready to go into that spooky mansion right there that's the haunted house Mm -hmm. over there Mm -hmm. yeah you know sometimes are way away far away from those sometimes they're inside so you know we kind of start scoring immersion after we've got our ticket and we're actually heading to the line Mm mm-hmm is there, com- is there complications? Should, should the ticket booth be before the haunt or inside the haunt or as long as the signage is good? Is it as long as it's the ticket booth should be your first stop after getting parked? Um, okay. you know, in my opinion, mm-hmm. um, like that's the way I mean, there's some that wand bef- right before the ticket booth, so sometimes security and then ticket booth. That's probably the preferred method, but it can slow lines down too if you don't have like multiple lanes, like Tyler was talking about. So but yeah, a ticket booth for and needs to be quick, as quick as you can get them through there. And but even your ticket some... booth itself can can be, you know, f- you know, mm-hmm. decorated, have a facade, and and start hinting at what that theme is if if you're allowed to. Like, some, I know some strip malls and stuff, you're kind of limited on what you can plaster on the outside of the building. But you know, there's at least some. You know, we've seen some haunts put like you know portable props you know standalone props that they can take in Mm -hmm. after they close for the night just like set them outside the doors in the parking lot and sometimes that's okay you know work with work with what's within your rules but go ahead and start telling us what your haunt's about before we enter the property you know um what were you gonna say brian oh um and make sure you have separate lines for like speed pass or online tickets so that way they can buy and, fast and that's all, that. all the way like it's from possible. the time they get there all the way through the, the whole attraction try to keep those lines separate because um when we buy time tickets and their vip online and we show up to the haunt and they want us to get in the general admission line basically to get to like through the security check we're like but we bought our tickets online and their vip i don't want to stand in this hour line just to get in the other line mm. so that line really really starts making that great attraction how you push those people through there um sometimes we've seen some midways where everybody's got to stand in a single line to get into the midway to be able to purchase tickets and that's just <laughs> making people wait in a long line to give you money is not a good idea if you can help it so I know everybody so, can't. But. So before we revamped our criteria here this last go around, we actually crawled like a bunch of haunts, Facebook pages and Google and started looking at what people were complaining about the most. And line weights was one of the highest ones. So like just trying to reiterate, <laughs> get your, try to, you know, obviously your line to get into the haunt, you want to 
try to you know you guys well we've never run a haunt but we do know that you guys usually try to shoot for about a minute and a half to two minutes when things are slowed you know spacing in between groups and sometimes you can take that down to 30 seconds or so during peak season when you just got to start jamming people out we know that there's a, a finesse to play there with with running the line through but definitely the, the shorter shorter lines equals happier customers nine times out of <laughs> so yeah but if you don't have those shorter lines that's where your cue entertainment comes in play yes. which you need probably anyway but yeah that's the other subjects is so yeah we, we've got theming say everything's all on par like even like your signs a lot of screen parks are really good at this like every haunt will have its own kind of facade to let you know what's going on inside that haunt but like um i'm thinking of like sir henry's down in florida like he, you know like when you see that icon skull character with the top hat like you see little bits of him in everywhere like you know and even though each attraction is separate it's all the same place mm -hmm. so like having that theming and consistency is part of the immersion of the show and that's part of what we're looking for mm -hmm. um What's so once we got the, that oh sorry what they the quote is customers don't remember what you do or say they remember how they how you made them feel exactly mm -hmm. exactly feeling mm -hmm. yep yep mm -hmm. all right go ahead do you know what causes haunted attractions to shut down before they even get started? The top three roadblocks are lack of funding, lack of leadership, lack of resources. As a member of the Haunters Toolbox, you get instant access to the tools you need to start and grow your own haunted attraction business. To get started, become a member at HauntersToolbox.com. So let's see, we got, uh, I got some notes we're trying to stay we're on track. Um, yeah. So yeah, your, your cue line and your, your pre-haunt entertainment, like have some uh, line actors out there and don't just stick Bobby Joe out there because you didn't know where else to put him in the haunt. Like <laughs> usually your cue actors are some of your better actors um, because, I mean, I know there's a variety of reasons. Part of it's because, you know, they're veteran people and they know how to spot, you know, troublemakers out in the crowd and they can kind of poke and prod. I was listening to Jape's episode not that long ago. Um, he was saying a few things like that. But um, and, and not only do the line actors, are they just like focusing on one group? They almost need to be like putting on a show themselves to where even multiple groups outside of that group in this line can be entertained by what they're doing to just the specific people they're next to, you know. Um, you can have projection shows. If you got room, you can have stage shows like fire twirlers and that sort of thing. Give mm -hmm. folks something to look at and be entertained by so that they forget about the waiting line. Um, we really like the virtual cues or the number systems when they can yes. be used, but like the haunts around here aren't wanting to go to that system because all of the customers are so used to waiting in line. Um, but there's a lot that are transitioning to that, and that just helps them be able to go out and spend more money before they go through because they can go to concessions while they're waiting. So that queue entertainment, you can also kind of look at that when you're setting up your queue line. One of our um, local haunts, they are putting um, food before and after, so it's easily accessible kind of while you're in line or right there when you're buying your tickets, and then you can also get back there later. So so when you come out, you can, you know, get something because getting scared and screaming makes you hungry or it does me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give them a chance to go buy a hot dog while they're waiting to get in the hunt. Monetize it, you know, mm -hmm. and they but don't have to wait fine. So they feel like they can, you know, if, if they if, as long as they're reassured that they're not losing their spot, you know, that they have a good, clear way of knowing when it's their turn to go next or to get in the short line then mm -hmm. by all means try to do that if you can yeah. help it and some do um like basement of the dead is a good exa good example they do the dj and the upbeat music and like the trending music and there's nothing wrong with that either you're entertaining your line it's not as haunty but they do have fun interactive characters doing that and those characters stay outside so we see that and it seems to work as well um don't blast like rob zombie really loud all night out there in the queue line mm -hmm. especially blast it there's like, so many times we can listen to dragula before we <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's also, you know, people are in a line and they're waiting and no matter what, they're wanting to talk. Um, so if you got the music so loud, they can't even have conversations and then they start getting mad because they're trying to yell over the music that you're playing. And so have something more toned down or fun or intermittently, like maybe ever so often do something, turn up some music, have a show going on and then kind of turn it down or play your movies or whatever it is you're doing. And We've seen crazy cue entertainment too, like bike shows where they're doing bike tricks and stuff. I prefer to 
for it to be haunt related, but at the same time, the mini wrestlers are pretty entertaining to watch. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> as long as you've got something going on, keep those customers as happy as you can and entertain and engaged mm -hmm. for as long as possible. Before we go inside the haunt, I want to um, go over a couple questions. I know Dan Crawford's been wanting somebody to come out and do his haunt. So, uh, Dan, type in what's your name of your haunt and where you're at location-wise. Maybe we can get something started. And I see where um, he says it focuses a facade. Facades are very important. We know that they're hard to build, but like your customers aren't going to comment on a lot of the stuff directly too, but that's because they don't notice things like that. Like they don't look at the haunted house and go, oh, they built that house and I really like how you built that they're just thinking oh this looks really spooky let's go in so just a lot of the things that we're mentioning you're probably not going to hear people directly saying you should have this or you should have that and they just, they just don't see it especially when we get to sound and they're not going to pick it out if you're just located in a pole barn or a warehouse that's not decorated they're just going to say oh well, that's unremarkable and you know, like they're just going to forget about it but you know <laughs> did Dan set what his haunt was I don't think he's put it in there okay yet. Yeah. We'll look at it. okay but his facade's going to be lit up all year long so that might be good you know especially with his logo on it and people know well, that's it's cool that yeah, definitely absolutely. that's like those um yeah, billboard mm -hmm. that's like those hamburger commercials i'm always telling tyler about like you get your burger king and your mcdonald's and they got these juicy hamburgers on the screen it makes you hungry no matter what time of day it is mm -hmm. yeah keep that in people's thoughts as they drive by get those impressions up mm -hmm. oh and, then, and before uh, we get out of midways when you get your concessions going get cider in there <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why uh, cider is limited to like the New England area, but y'all need to bring it down to here. Uh, a lot of, well, there's a haunt in Hannibal. Um, and they do s'mores kits. They have a big campfire and they have all their food trucks and vendors around the campfire. Then they got a big digital LED uh, billboard that says a number. So when yep. you get your ticket, uh, it's just a different number attached to your ticket. So they write on the ticket. So you're, well, I went up there the first, they incorporated um, Q or virtual Q. It wasn't virtual, but it was manually digital uh, board and um, a ticket. Just stand there, listen to the customers saying, you mean I don't have to wait in line? Mm -hmm. No, there's food and stuff. What? I don't have to wait in line? Kids were jumping up. Oh my God, let's go do this. Let's go. So just that relief, you know, and I think there was even reviews on their on um, social media pages about not waiting in line and more things to do. And I've I interviewed Justin Hill with um, his haunt and he does the same thing. He creates a big environment outside and then he has different ways to go to each attraction. And he says he can control, he can control the queue if he wants to, if it's a slow night, he can make everybody outside spend more money and then he can, nobody be in the house. Like, All right, okay. Let him in. Let's him in. <laughs> let's set him, you know, let's, because he wasn't making any money on his vending stuff at all. But as soon as he's he made that the what are we calling him uh, <clears throat> midways, yeah. Mm -hmm. So as soon as he started that, it's like all of his the uh, vendor sales went up, his merchandise sales went up, everything went up, and he and everybody was happy because they weren't waiting in line. He could control the flow if he wanted to. I know to get there is a process. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I know. It's but, but it works. It works. It so sure well. does work. It's all right. part of that customer experience, and it can be a big step towards getting that great step. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, and then before we go, uh, Bob was curious. Uh, certain things you tend to see in the more successful, higher-rated home haunts. Do you see? Do you do a lot of home haunts? Um, I'm going to pick on the phrase higher-rated in home haunts in the same sentence because as the scare factor we define a home haunt is when you do not charge or require anything in exchange for admission and for that we cannot provide a score because there is an infinite value for that an entertainment value you know as long as it's free so like we usually don't score them unless they're asking for donations or charging admission admission but for personally the ones we've been to um what we see and ones that we would score higher if we were is the really strong actors like we understand they don't have the same budget um but home haunts are just amazing to go through anyways because mm -hmm. they're so passionate about them and you you're very welcomed as a customer and i i think a lot of the home haunts that are stronger are just they have a lot of intriguing actors engaging actors they're interactive and they're it's like you pluck them from some of the better haunts and, and put them in there and although there aren't as many they still one actor might cover five areas and and still knock it out of the park 
most of these same things still apply just on a scaled down version, except for like your ticket booth or like midways, you know, obviously you can't turn your neighborhood into a midway, but you mm -hmm. know, when we get start getting inside the Han and like your outside ambient stuff, that's kind of the immersion that we're talking about would be like your outside decorations. And then once we move inside, when we'll we'll start talking about some of these other things. But and if it's a home <laughs> that wants to get a lot of customers into their doors, because sometimes they do not um, definitely work on that website and hitting all of those spots, because making yourself making people aware that you are open on certain days and that you want customers is definitely an important mm -hmm. thing for letting people know that, you know, you're there. And even home haunts, you have an advantage because you're not charging money. So flyers, postcards, uh, I used to take, when I was doing my home haunt, took flyers of Spirit Halloween. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just trying to get people involved, grocery stores, high mm -hmm. traffic areas, hanging up your banners and stuff. Because you're really, you know, you're only looking for about 500 to 1,000 people because you know you're going to get flow actors, you know, trick-or-treaters and stuff. So mm -hmm. if you get too many people in your neighborhood, the cops don't really like it. Cause, right. Yeah, or your neighbors sometimes. <laughs> yeah. the neighbor's like, well, next time I'm going to have to buy more candy, I guess, huh? I like, yeah, <laughs> buy more candy next year. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, take us inside. Oh. Uh, one more uh, restrooms. Oh. restrooms. Yeah, restrooms. we don't score in restrooms, but no, please have them and enough for your customers. If you don't think restrooms are important, try taking your wife to a haunt after dinner and let us know how that goes. <laughs> is, it, is there a quota? Do you have a quota? Like if you're through, you know, ten thousand people a year, is or like I don't, I don't have a quota because we don't know like how many, you know, those haunts numbers, but. They need to be clean. You try to clean to, them. You have to keep them clean. We know one haunt told us that he had his cleaned every after every night that he was open and before they opened for the week. Which we know customers make messes. They drink. They do everything all over the porta potties. Yeah. But we've also seen some where it's clear that they haven't been cleaned all weekend. And that's the only place where your paying customers have to go to the restroom. So. Mm -hmm. And as much as you may not, yeah, the ones with lights are really nice. Even, if they, under even if they don't have lights, go to Harbor Freight and get them little sticky ones. Did that too. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we've we've got a porta potty here because we work from home mm -hmm. and we work mm -hmm. across the yard. It sounds weird, but we have a porta potty over there because mm -hmm. sometimes you just can't make it to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've got one of those little lights in there. It works great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. Now we can get inside. So one of the first things you're going to see after you have embarked on your journey into the haunt is the scenes you know the the path that you're taking through everything that you see hear taste touch smell everything inside the haunts we put under our special effects category um i know most people think oh special effects is just your fog machines and this you know your you know that's your, sort of, props. That's your props mm -hmm. but we call all of your set dressings your actual scenes and props absolutely everything like i say that you see hear touch is all under our special effects so um, one of the first things that we're looking at under this is how realistic and believable are your scenes? Like, can we tell that you just slapped up plywood walls and stuffed a bunch of stuff from Goodwill in there? Or did you actually make an attempt to make it look like it could pass for a real, you know, well, uh, living room? And stuff. I'm not saying the Goodwill stuff's <laughs> bad, but did you just buy a bunch of it and throw it in the corner and seeing it looks like a hospital because you found a gurney in a wheelchair? Or does it actually have all of the things that it needs to make it look like a hospital? But, you know, yeah. um, adding detail to things is what what takes something from good to great details, layers. So having stuff can work in your advantage, like having a lot of stuff for things like Noro, who has massive OCD to look at and to train her squirrels on and absorb and, and take in all the detail. That's absolutely wonderful and great. That will add points if done correctly. But like I say, it, there's got to be a method to the madness. It can't just be a hodgepodge and thrown around and, and look haphazard. You know, it looks like it needs to almost look functional Sometimes or like it used okay, to be functional. Not, not often, you know. Like if there's an asylum going on, you're going to see some haphazard sure, things. Sure, because chaos and outbreak. It's got to make sense though, right? You're yeah, looking for yeah it needs to definitely make sense, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if you have a hallway that I can look down, you know, I need to you know, probably see rooms on both sides of the hallway and, you know. That the biggest sort of thing. thing with the set design for us is we need to be able to look at it with nothing else going on, no sounds, no nothing, and to be able to see it and, and know what it is by looking at it. So if you can step back and go, okay, does this actually look like an examination room or does it look like my bedroom like that? You know, we do see or, things or, like that. Or does it only things. look like an exam room? Because I think it looks like an exam room. Like, okay, you have to be real with yourself at some point and be like, okay, I need somebody to help, you know, look at this and like, 
<laughs> that doesn't, you know, hasn't been looking at it for the last six months and say, what do you think this room is? And we're, and what's their answer? We're not That's looking not... really at money here either. Yes, money mm -hmm. helps. Yes, money can buy big animations, big props, things that can do things. We're looking we're... at creativity and mm -hmm. uniqueness and believability. You know, mm -hmm. we're not looking at budget. <laughs> I mean, we've seen people use toilet paper and toilet paper rolls. <laughs> And it worked very well. Mm -hmm. It just depends on kind of like what you're doing. And you could just got to look at it in the right lighting. Um, most of the time it looks worse with the lights on. And that's <laughs> okay. That's part of it. But look at if, if you're you, going to put an can... orange light on it, make sure you look at it and go, okay, wait, that washed that out and made it clearly toilet paper. Like that's not good. <laughs> so this podcast episode sponsored by Scarlet Badges. We always were looking for ideas to to get those actors to take it to the next level. I really want to do something that they can use more than just a meal or they can use more than just a that a boy, that a girl. They love this stuff, but it's not really promoting a haunter. And then I sit down, Scarab Badges comes out. That's when I realized this is amazing because not only is it giving them an attaboy, but it's also promoting them all year round and for to promote somebody to give somebody accolades all year round and have them be able to wear it on their shoulder with pride means a lot this right here says this is who nailed it on this day in this year for the rest of their life for the rest of their haunting life and that's what i really love about this product is you're able to give haunting to somebody an attaboy 365 days a year and that's so hats off to you guys i think this is a great product and i wish you the best of luck because it's awesome Get your scare badges at scarebadges.com. The biggest thing that we're also looking for here that goes that this is probably one of the biggest ones we see inside that makes a, an attraction go from good to great is hiding your effects that should not be seen by customers. And this can be anything from speakers, uh, water bottles, your light cords, your fog machine, your sensors. The lights to fog machines hide those things because me and Tyler are like, ooh, there's a fog machine. Or we've seen fog machines out on the floor and almost tripped over them. If there's a scene where an actor could come up behind somebody, whether they're trying to push them or not, a customer is probably going to look back. They need to not be able to see your speakers. <laughs> of your animations, this is one reason why Netherworld is one of the most outrageously known and most detailed haunts like go through there and it's harder for you to try to find something that does not belong in the attraction like it's really hard to find something there that's that's what makes them great is it's it's real to to is about as real as you can get it's not perfect mm -hmm. there's nobody that's perfect yet or we have not found them but it is damn close mm -hmm. well that's camo netting up there i could tell it's camo netting. <laughs> <laughs> i always spot out the um the unifies the wireless internet the i'm like internet. Unify. Uh -huh. See the flashing <laughs> LED up there? I see it. I see it. Yeah. That's the Wi Fi. And a lot of you guys are not that picky, but I'm telling you, when you when you when they're walking through, they may not realize they saw it, but you just don't take them out of the immersion. Like if you see something and tell your actors, keep those things hidden. Hide your backpack. As hide soon your as they see something like that, even if it doesn't register up here, back here, it's oh yeah, I forgot I'm in a haunted house. Not you don't you want them to forget world, they yeah. need to be in, in that world that you're trying to put them in. Mm -hmm. So that's the gist of it for like scene design and you know detail that sort of thing uh, but in with the special effects category something else we look at is your sound effects and your sounds and one of my notes here it says stop skimping on audio and using small shitty speakers you got from goodwill <laughs> you know, if i can hear that your speaker is blown you're not getting a 10 for audio full stop you know <laughs> uh, some of some of the haunts that we go to like that have a very clear your focus on audio and it's just like you can feel it in your chest and like you can't escape the audio it should be loud enough that it can mask sound bleed from other rooms but not so loud that i can't think or talk to the other people in my group or hear what the actor's saying you know but it needs and to have enough intensity to be speaking there's some bassy rooms every now and then where we can't hear each other but but That's still, it shouldn't little. be enough to where an actor that comes out and goes, you know, right. I have to be able to hear that and get that startle, you know, so make it until loud enough that it's intense and can create that oh shit mood and if you do and it's going to work because when you take somebody's sense of hearing away they can't hear somebody sneaking up on them so that mm -hmm. increases all their other senses and gets the blood pumping and it just 
human instinct. You can't help it. Sound is so important. Do not skimp on your sound. Yeah, sound is very, very important. And I know a lot of people are like, we added sound and nobody's commenting on it. And it's like, but they don't, it just makes it feel more real to them. Mm -hmm. They feel more immersed and they don't know why. They're not looking at it individually categorized like this. A lot of these things you don't notice unless they're not there. Mm-hmm. you know <laughs> and it's very awkward in some scenes where there's no sound especially mm-hmm. indoors outdoors it can go by sometimes because you've got natural sounds of outside but yeah inside is sound and you can create scares with sounds very effectively too mm-hmm. like just recording a very realistic scream and playing it low in a corner will make everybody turn their head and wonder what screamed even though there's nothing there we went to a haunt in ohio probably three years ago and we were actually in between like the indoor and the outdoor part of the haunt. And there was like just this little hallway. And as we were standing there waiting on a couple group members to catch up, we were just like, what in the heck is that sound? And it was just this low droning. Like we never really could actually pick it out, but like we knew something was playing and it wasn't right. Like it it's like a, in a horror movie, like paranormal activity or something. Mm-hmm. When they get that, just that low droning bassy sound, it's just, there's a frequency dread in you yeah people are people are using it uh they call them tubes or something and it's a real mm-hmm. low 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 free you can't hear it but you can feel it and it makes yeah. people sick and anxious and yes a lot we of have been to, it, mm-hmm. so. we've been to at least two where we were able to pick it up on pick up on it well because we knew that nothing else was causing that, but the general customer is not going to have any idea why their heart is suddenly racing, racing faster because that's what it does it's really cool we like to get them all amped up in the queue line, just kind of. I wonder what they would do. They'll <laughs> <laughs> just start passing out and out in the queue yeah. line. Like, yes. Tapping out the first room. I'm out. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. But hey, you already got your money. So, you know, your job is done. So, yeah. I look good. Mm-hmm. You're just making it easier on your actors. Get them out of there early. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Get that queue line out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So, next would probably be uh, like your props and animations. Like, we're also looking for realistic uh, realism and all that sort of thing here. Um, if I can tell that you've got something that's 10 years old from Scare Factory and it's falling apart because I can see all the yellow foam falling out of the jaw, like, you know, that probably needs fixed. You know? We see that a lot. Yeah. A lot. It, you'd be amazed. Yeah. Like, if, you know, make sure all your stuff up, is up to snuff. And um, realism is just as important for your props as it is for your scene. You know, and make stuff match, too. Like, if you go out and buy a, a poison props zombie or something that looks really awesome, it's gnarly and getting ready to pop out at me, but it's surrounded by, you know, plywood or, you know, just black pl- black plastic walls. It's, it's, it's not consistent and cohesive. It's out of place, you know. Make make the surroundings fit the props and, and stuff like that. And I've, I've heard of people building scenes around props, but, you know, then that's a whole other rabbit hole about, you know, prop placement and things that we're not probably Transition. the best qualified to talk about. But Transition just... zones are another, like, there's a lot of different things under these. But, yeah, your biggest one is to keep them immersed as much as possible. Like, if you're using something to create something it's not, just try to make sure you hide it as much as you can. I always recommend, like, instead of having a a, ha- a huge haunt that's 80% done, create a smaller haunt. Focus on those rooms that really need to be done. Mm-hmm. Black out the rest of the stuff. It could be black hallways or a strobe or something stupid you know just to fill in that that spot but at least you'll have those toys and props with the complete scene right mm-hmm. through the rest of seen- it through the hallway you know just dark it out yes just and sometimes we we cringe when um, someone says oh we took our haunt and we made it longer this year and we're like i hope that means that you uh fixed the scenes that you had that needed work in the first place mm, right because that doing that would probably be a good idea but yes you know a lot of them do want to in- increase that length which we get it's part of the value but it's not really a good value if it's not a good show during some of that time mm-hmm. right uh, so yeah we're <laughs> i was looking we gotta have I notes should, or we'll should have been working way off track uh, also as far on the uh, props and animations um they also need to be effective um if you use step pads please hide them hide your step pads please <laughs> Put a rug over them or something, you know. Oh, <laughs> it's down really, really yep. well or something, so people don't trip on them. But yep. we have seen people successfully hide them, and we have one reviewer who, if she sees them, she steps over them on purpose. So yeah, and mm-hmm. just hide them if you can. It's not always possible, but yeah, use, use the light beam sensors. The 
Yeah. I'd say, I'd say I'm not a Han owner I'm, I, and I don't build them. I, I'm a mechanic. I understand how the triggers work and all that sort of thing. But to me, a light sensor should work anywhere a step pad should work. Like, Yeah, fall kind of messes with them, but, the, but there's a, a certain type, PIR, PIR sensor or something. The fog doesn't mess with it. Um, but yeah, and then going back to uh, um, incomplete rooms and sound, sound still out there. Uh, had a surround sound system, home theater system. Dolby mm-hmm. six, you know, six different speakers. Mm-hmm. And then we had we had a so uh, an old JL audio, I think, subwoofer. And so that was our that was our medical theme. And at the subwoofer, we just had a heartbeat. Boom, boom. Mm-hmm. Oh right? yeah. But the subwoofer was here, but you'd walk in between until you almost got to the, you know, so it kind of got a little louder and louder as you were getting close to it. And mm-hmm. then Dr. Phobia's room was right there. So, but just that subwoofer. And mm-hmm. like you're saying, people didn't realize the sound was on, but if they don't realize it until it's gone, like you were saying, um, mm-hmm. they don't realize and it until it's gone. But when it's there, it's part of it. But like, do you hear the music? No, I didn't realize there was any music playing because your senses are so, like you were saying, Tyler, overloaded and you got sense mm-hmm. and you're feeling stuff. So the sound is just kind of, just kind of subconsciously so back there, you know, so. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's okay. doing a lot of work, just like your actors and your props are. You know? Yeah. And yeah. I can't remember if Tyler said ambient sound and then having sound on top of that is good too. So like having, if you're in a cafeteria and having people talking and then having the prop sounds on top of that or similar situations. with Dishes like a, clashing or something like we use a little small, mm-hmm. Uh, Bluetooth cube speakers with SD card, just a little tiny tweeter. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they lasted. We kept them plugged in because they lasted like four or five hours, and they yep. had to be retired. So yeah. we just leave them plugged in, and as soon as you turn your power on, they come back. They come on too. So it's something you really don't have to worry about. And then they they might last a season or two. You might replace them. All depends where you're located at. But yeah, I believe in that too. Having little small sounds, baby crying, mm-hmm. someone mm-hmm. screaming in the corner. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. definitely how to take your sound to the next level. That and then the bass too. Yes. All of that together. We were we had a note on here. Fear Columbus has got really good sound. If if any of you guys are curious, like what um, some of your layered sound. I don't know what else to call it, uh, <laughs> but they have sound very engines. very good sound there. And we've actually got some videos that you can mm-hmm. watch where you can hear the sounds. And they do a lot of like the the universal style scares with the sounds also. So like when an actor comes out, a sound and light gets triggered with it. And that just, you know, number one, makes it where the actor is not yes. screaming their head off all night. Right. But number two, it, it's, it's consistency and it, it forces, you know, it, it's mm-hmm. you know, so besides the effects, which we're probably missing some things because that can go on forever. We also don't want to run yeah. out of time either. But. Your cast and costuming, obviously, um, are very, very important. The The cast at your haunted house are basically your backbone. Um, without cast members, you have a museum. Mm-hmm. Um, so and that levels from all the way from having that foundation of the haunted house and and having good actors to also how the owners and management treat the actors so um be thinking about like if you're having a lot of actors quit and not coming back um what what can you do differently are you treating them the way that they feel like they should be treated are there small gifts you can give them or pizza parties or can you do stuff with them during the off season to keep it in their heads the scare it badges that brian's pointing to is a great way um we need to get hold of you for some scare factor ideas on that too <laughs> but see we're we're all volunteer all 28 teams are all volunteers and tyler and i do have to do things like to to thank them like we we want them to know that we appreciate all of them so we've been uh, very blessed with our teams and like like Nora yeah. said we're all volunteer nobody gets paid um so we just have to try to think of like gifts and something we can offer them to get them to stay. And like, luckily we've only like just this past year, we only had two. We only had two teams that weren't able to stay. So our retention rate is really good here for volunteers, but they are very, very important. You must have them. You must treat them well. Please thank them. Let them know they're doing a good job. Give some of them some awards every so often or every night or whatever it is that you can do. Um, but you, um, you do need them to do certain things while they're inside the attraction. Um, Mm -hmm. Haunted houses that are great have actors that know how to read the crowd. Um, They've got that experience. Um, They know how close to get to someone. They know how to read them. 
They also know what to say and what not to say. Um, there's tons of don't say, get out, you know, there's your generic phrases, yep. overused phrases, boo, get boo, out, get out. me, want to play. Stay and, a while. And, <laughs> yeah. and he won like last year. I think he said fresh meat four times and Tyler was even filming and Tyler's like, oh God, he's doing it again. <laughs> so, so do you recommend them? Do you recommend the managers, owners having scripts? Are you looking for just originality? Working with so, the, I will. We're more so just looking for originality. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have a story, which we recommend having a story, give them some type of baseline to work off of. Like while they're going through your room, they're at this part of the story. Try to get them to understand this part of it before they leave. You know, so that gives them enough to where they can say, okay, now I have something I can work with. But it gives them creative freedom. To a give them kind of ownership of their space, which can help with retention performance, that sort of thing. But you know, it also gets the story across to the customer, and uh, it should be, in theory, at least a good blend of of both worlds there. But yeah, yeah, if they've got ideas, and they're like, "Well, I want to come up with my own lines." Say, "Well, they need approval." You give me they need approval those lines, and yeah, we'll read them and look through them. And you may have to sit down with every single actor every so often and say, okay, this won't work for you. And that goes back to delegation. Someone needs to sit down with them because if you just tell them no all the time, that that doesn't really psych them up to do all this hard work for you. So um, we would, we see both scripted. We've seen haunts that are very, very scripted in which the characters say the same thing from year to year. And we even know those lines by heart now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, always have them prepared for plan B, which is when a customer says something to you. So like if you welcome them to your lair and they're like, well, where's the door? Or how are you doing today? Make sure the, that your characters have something written down to respond to them so that they don't only stay in the script and they're not talking to customers when they're talking to them. And then if they have plan B's written down, that's when they should be less likely to say, get out. Because a lot of times actors say that because they don't have anything else to say. They don't know what to do. It's a fallback and just a trying, trying to get them, you know, trying to shoo the customers along. They're trying to scare forward too. And that's something else. I don't know how to teach how to scare forward, but I know that you want to do that. Mm-hmm. And as customers, we also don't want you scaring us backwards into other groups. So yeah, it's good for gotta, throughput. Gotta, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You got to balance that out and make sure your actors aren't stopping people for long periods of time, especially when you're busy and things like that. But you can also have characters that aren't talking at all and they are physically moving and they could be an extreme haunt with an actor that's doing something crazy and I can tell by looking at them that I do not want to get within two foot of them because they're going to whack my head off with a chainsaw or whatever it may be and they don't have to say a word so like the body language of what some of these actors are doing um, is very important as well and even adding the body language to the talking an actor that can do all of those things is is becoming a great actor someone that can read the crowd and move around and I don't need to know you don't need to talk to me for me to know what you are. So that's, it It gets difficult, but that's what kind of raises that bar there. You also need a variety of characters mm-hmm. too. Like even if you just have a, uh, like a, a clown attraction is the first one, kind of the example we use. Like, you know, just because they're clowns doesn't mean they're all jumping out and going, what? you know, laughing and screaming and doing their clown cackling, whatever they're doing. Like, you know, there's, there's different breeds of clowns, you know, and like try to make everybody different so that we're not knowing what to expect around the next corner, you know. Mm -hmm. So every haunted house should try to figure out what every actor is doing. Mm -hmm. Even if they're letting the actors choose it themselves, you should be aware of what they're supposed to be doing or what they say they're doing and do the casual walkthrough every so often or have your cast management walkthrough and make sure that they seem to be doing that. And that's something else we see a lot too is it's very, very hard to know what your actors are doing inside. And as customers, we understand that. But it just always make sure they know what they're supposed to be doing and that you know what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, let's see. Oh, variety. Yeah, the, sometimes that can um, be tough to do, uh, especially during the peak of season and like Hell Week and like when you start getting conga lines and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I, like we get it. <laughs> you, see, you can't always help it. Sometimes all you have time to do is just pop out and reset and, and you know, try to get in as many scares as you can. But you know, there again, the the way that you pop out and the exact sound that you make and like you, you still get a few seconds there with at least a, a chunk of people and you can still if you if if you're 
well versed in what your haunt storyline is and what your character is, you can spit out the right lines to mm-hmm. to get the customer through and and help minimize the the badness of the jungle. <laughs> and it should blend with where you are. You don't want to be talking about something that makes zero sense with where you are, but at the same time, yeah, we've had some sometimes it works. We've had some actors <laughs> pop out of a door and say pineapple. Well. They were trained by Alan Hops, and that worked were, very well. Uh, like it worked. It got a start out of us, but it's like, so, it I mean, it was and, great. And, and the last podcast, we had Japes on, and he scared somebody with Boo. So, yep. But it I wasn't was just Boo. It was Boo, you. and then he started doing his own you know, his own little thing. So it wasn't just like Boo, and then, yeah. right, you know. Yeah, I think it's, it gets tricky when customers are not reacting the way that you want them to or not moving as fast as you need them to, and you're like, I don't know what to do now. And right. that's where that plan B really comes into play. So, Character development yeah. helps with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about as, your customer, too. It's all mm-hmm, about your that's customer. True. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. If you have me as a customer, I talk a lot. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. <just> me. <laughs> oh, really? You want me to get on that table over there? Okay. Oh, I what will. What are you going to do to me when I get over there? <laughs> you tell me to. Remember that, too, as an actor. If you're going to yeah. tell us to do that, we're going to try to do it. Yeah. Make sure playing. the table can hold up to it, too. Because yeah. Because we've yeah. got, we've sat up on some tables and nearly took the whole room down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that the actors were like, oh, I didn't know she was actually going to do it. And yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never, never ask the question. Yeah. You got to be prepared. Like you said, you got to have plan B. You got to have. You do. Don't threaten us with a good time. We'll yep. Yep. <laughs> so these actors need to be dressed well. They need to have something on that's believable. It can be from Spirit Halloween, but distress it. Make it different. Make it your own. Make it unique. And maybe put something under it to where we can't tell that it's just some little thin lacy thing. You mm-hmm. know? Layers, like, layers. Yes, layers. Layers. Keep all hoodies Accessories. and t-shirts hidden. Turn them inside out if you've forgotten. Wore them there. Put them on backwards if you still have a logo that's noticeable. Black shoes, dark colored shoes. That I don't want to see your white converse <laughs> poking out under your little even if you're a nurse. Grim Reaper suit, you know? is a little <laughs> strange for a nurse, but I guess it depends on the time period. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, cover all of the things that we shouldn't be seeing. If you're a clown, it just one of the things that bugs me the most is seeing normal skin on clowns. Bare, untreated skin yeah. is rarely acceptable. You very for, rarely, for yeah. a great haunt. You know, there should be some type of treating or distressing or something going on. Like mm-hmm. even if you're a victim, like you should have wounds or bloody or grime where you've been rolling around on it, you know, something. You should not be clean in a haunted house. <laughs> if you're wearing a mask, make sure you black your eyes out. Yes. And you know, if you're wearing latex mask. mask, remember that you may not need a speaking role. I hate it when we hear people talking in masks and they sound like this and you can't hear what they're supposed to be saying, you know, stop doing that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be a quiet character if you're in one of those masks. <laughs> say something that we didn't. We're yeah, not or grumble or something, right? Yeah, yeah you yeah. can also get some kind of mouthpieces. I've seen a few do it that they make some kind of noises under those masks that are, or they, yeah, they learn how to do some kind of clicking or something. I'm gonna give away somebody's secret, and they're probably gonna be mad. But some people put a uh, turkey call. Yeah, turkey call. Say, turkey That's call. What it is. Mm -hmm. Make some pretty awesome click and pop sounds Mm -hmm. with those. And Mm -hmm. if you need to talk and you've got a mask on and nobody's hearing you or customers don't seem to be paying attention to you, they do make awesome voice enhancers that sometimes can work with certain costumes too. As long as the speaker is good enough, but yeah. (laughs) A lot of actors are using these Aztec death whistles, but... Oh, I love the yeah, death, death whistles. whistles, but they're cool. becoming so popular, too, that we're seeing a lot they of them. They can still catch you off guard and get a startle. Oh, yeah. 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 Those would be good for, like, a pop scare type of role, for mm-hmm. sure, or for somebody that's not well-versed at talking very well, or, yeah. Costumes. Mm-hmm. Um, the only other thing we were talking about, Brian said layers. That's definitely most important, and just modify everything you have, make it yours, but also accessories. Um, characters sometimes can become a lot more believable when they're carrying something or doing something that makes sense with their character, so a nurse could have a needle or you know she could have a medical chart and she's maybe writing down your name in it or any of those things are also considered costuming when when a when a an actor is using it as a prop it's basically costuming if it's something that is static in a room or moves around in a room and it's like anchored to the wall or whatever like that would we, we would call a prop but if it's something that an actor carries with them and is fixed to that character then that's when we include it as part of costuming mm-hmm. just for 
rating purposes. But <laughs> how about uh, how about breaking character and the only time it's absolutely okay to break character is when it's an absolute emergency and you cannot stay in character to get whatever it is you need to do done. So not like to, not to get a phone number or something like that. Or... No, I'm, I'm please don't ask people for their phone numbers. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> and and don't stop and say, oh, hang on, wait a second. Get your phone out and turn the music back on in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah don't ask us if you if you, so we had a clown come up to us one night and he's like so i have a chainsaw over there if i get it and turn it on are you guys gonna run from it <laughs> do i really yeah. gotta do this to... <laughs> so yeah please always stay in character <laughs> we're like i don't know pick it up and try and find out <laughs> and I are super picky and if we see actors actor like well if we see management inside the haunt we would like for you to try to blend in as much as you can too the best example i've seen of this there was a somebody who was working on a fog machine that was busted and as we came around there i mean he was clearly in a hoodie staff you know radio hat you know the whole he was definitely a staff member working on a fog machine but as soon as we popped around the corner he started acting like he was waylaying on this fog machine he'd be like i can't get this damn thing to work <laughs> you know and he, he just immediately awesome. jumped into a role and we're like you go and then like okay it's off to the next scene like yeah i've been busted i've been busted yeah i'll take the flashlight on my face there yeah. you go just do something, have something ready and as an actor if you're a chainsaw actor is probably the biggest one if you can't get that chainsaw to start still wave it around like it's working make yeah. the sound you know, you know do, do something, something. Don't we had actors it. yeah what? yeah, yeah our always... chainsaw guy he broke down one this chainsaw and he came out with it <laughs> Yep. Yep. You know, the, yep. with an That's air chainsaw <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a little more entertaining because you're like oh shit this guy is like legit crazy you know it makes there's you... nothing keeping you from still banging it on the walls and doing whatever you got they do. were laughing they were carrying on they still had a good time so yep. i said yeah just keep doing that until we get it fixed keep keep it going don't stop heck yeah and see tyler and i would definitely point out that character because they went above and beyond what they normally would do yeah they'd probably get so a shout out they probably please. would yeah 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 mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. that that's the ideal scenario, but it's a good adaptation trying to overcome it. Yeah, and sure. and characters that are out out of the haunted house, like if they come out for some reason, try to stay in character then too, because we don't I don't break that immersion. Like we don't want to know that you're not a nurse. We don't want to know that you're a, a normal person that night like us, and you're just in a costume. We don't want to know that. I will definitely echo what Japes was saying. If you're anywhere visible by the public, you need to be in your character under normal circumstances. Like if you're going out for a smoke break or bathroom break, you need to be in character until there is mm -hmm. zero chance of somebody spotting you. Yeah. And preferably haunt owners if you have porta pots and you're letting your actors use them, if you can put several for them only somewhere else to keep them out of customer visibility, that would be the preferred method. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we have our own actor spot where they smoke and yeah. they take their breaks and stuff like out that. Out of our so. eyesight, none of us need to be able to see that, keep them hidden so that they have their space. And yep. I just want to pause for a moment and thank philip from the haunted attraction network if you guys listen to this podcast you'll love everything that philip is doing over at the haunted attraction network that's hauntedattractionnetwork.com there's weekly podcasts philip also does the seasonal entertainment source magazine that is free to subscribe to yes it is a real magazine to your mailbox so go on check out everything the haunted attraction network has to offer and make sure to sign up for their email newsletter at hauntedattractionnetwork.com slash newsletter So going back to a little bit of story and immersion type of stuff, um, the reason why we have this as part of our criteria and are so focused on it is because people love stories. I cannot under, you know, I, I can't overstate the importance of a good story if you're able to do one properly. Um, but it also needs to be unique. You know, if you're using movie monsters, eh, you know, it's not so. I know a lot of us we've love got, them, but we've, you can get in trouble for that. We've got well. a haunt here close to us that actually does use movie monsters, but he does them in ways that you don't normally see them, you know, and he, he his his storyline is it's a collection of, you know, the most evil souls that the devil could find, you know, um, mm -hmm. 
it's not just Bob's boo barn and he decided to use movie monsters. You know, he's got a method to it. Um, not saying that still not saying that we endo- endorse using movie monsters, but if you're going to do something that somebody else has done, which most of us already know here that it's hard to find something that nobody else has done, but put your own spin on it, make mm-hmm. it yours, put but, a twist to the story right. and make that story evident and obvious to us. Bef- ideally before we go through. So we know what we're walking into as part of your, you know, your immersion in your queue line in building up that story and letting us know what we're walking into even before we get into the attraction. And even the, the website, like a lot of times right before we get to a haunt, I guess we should have said this earlier, but I generally do have, I have our big laptop with us and I pull up a haunt and I'm like, okay, have they changed their story this year? Do they have a story? What is the story? And I read it to Tyler. And not only do we, are we aware of what we're getting ready to go into, but it it enhances your excitement. Like it piques your interest. You're like, ooh, this so-and-so created all of these things and they're going to come after us and they're under the ground. And it, I'll, you know, it makes me want to go more. I will take that back a couple of steps though and say that the reason why you look it up on the web website and on the laptop is because mm-hmm. most haunts aren't that great at letting us know what the story is before we go through. Yeah. A lot of times we're we're trying to figure it out and piece it together as we're going through and we can kind of pick up and get a general idea. But I'd say probably 50% of the time when we pull an owner aside and say, what's your story? It is different than we thought it was when we after we came out of the haunt. Mm-hmm. So, That's something we usually and, ask every owner is what was what is your theme? And sometimes it's before and after because we do get them wrong sometimes. But the more realistic you can make that and the more obvious you can make it, it increases all of that immersion. And we're not saying the, you need like a really detailed storyline. No, keep it stupid, simple, as, no. as simple as you can. But those the, characters that you're talking about in that storyline and why they're there need to be pretty evident. It needs to be able to be dumbed down enough to where the average 14 year old girl can come through and, and a understand it and be appreciate it. Mm-hmm. But also on the, it, it can be detailed and convoluted enough to where that like when us reviewers come through and we start interacting with the actors and we start trying to pull this information out. OK, now we can get into the weeds a little bit and we can start giving points for character development and unique, you know, creativity and uniqueness and believability. And, you know, that's where having the in-depth story can come in handy. But it, like I say, it does need to also be able to be simple enough that the average 14 year old girl can understand it mm-hmm. and if they are and too busy can, and scared and got their head buried in the boyfriend's back and you know that sort of thing. But, <laughs> you can yeah, face. Yeah, oh, go ahead. You'll get you'll get people like you guys that'll want to know the entire mm-hmm. story and you'll pick out things within the scenes. You know they relate to the story, but then like mm-hmm. you said, you'll have mm-hmm. okay, it's Doctor Phobia. He's a deranged scientist, and all the all the phobias are running loose in the house. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. But then some people want to know well. What year was it or what exactly happened? How did this really happen? <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So right. just for like you guys, yes. And the other other people that really like me, I would do the same thing. And that's and another that, thing and- though, too. It's almost like the sound effects and different things like that is people, you know, when a story is good and thought out and cohesive and in an experience as you're going through the haunt, they're not gonna pick up on it. But they're also going to know that it wasn't, you know, when their friend asks about what it was, you know, they're not just going to say, oh, it's just a bunch of random stuff. You know, they're going to say it's an asylum or it's a this or it's a that, you know. Yeah, it's so, 1960s. You don't hear Metallica. It's not. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, right. <laughs> storyline just like brian saying make sure you follow it don't have things that clearly don't make any sense with that you want to keep them immersed in that story i think hell's gate does a really good job at kind of pushing theirs and showing people like while they're waiting what's going on in there but creating those promo videos that should be on your website is another good way to show people that storyline and you can play those in the queue line you know get people pumped up and know what they're getting ready to go into but for those that may ask earlier i'll touch on it real quick if you don't use a storyline, we we do score on it. We score how creative it is and how well we could tell what it was. But if you don't use one, we actually can NA that question. So if you legitimately... It's one of the only questions we have that we yeah. can omit, and it will not hinder or help your score. It can be neutral. So mm-hmm. if you just flat out don't want to have them. So, because we know that not all haunts have them, and it's not fair to give them a zero if they weren't trying to follow one. But sometimes great people one, don't. The great ones do use the story and can take advantage of those extra points when it's done right. So. And customers, rem- I think customers remember it more. Um, your actors, well, your actors kind of have a box to work with. 
Yeah. Like, you know, like the, at the Dent Schoolhouse, the pumpkin smasher, we took him a pinata full of pumpkins last year to smash, but he said <laughs> little kids are coming up to him and know who he is and stuff. Like, that's pure advertising for your haunted house. Mm-hmm. So, getting that out there and they know who he is and what he does. And it's all about having character background. And to have that, you kind of need a storyline. I want to make plus, one more quick comment about oh. the, uh, the consistency, talking about like there wasn't Metallica in the 60s. They also didn't have jbl subwoofers so keep it hidden yeah it's not saying you can't use it because it's a sound effect and it can be helping you know increase the intensity of the haunt you just don't want to see it you know (laughs) hide it in an old vintage speaker that works sometimes hide it in a record player or anything Mm -hmm. that you can get them in like that stuffed animals like an old chest or stuffed animals can sometimes make them sound better too but it just depends (laughs) yeah what were you gonna say brian oh i was gonna talk about uh, another thing about Backstory as a designer, um, it'll help you focus on your theme more. And you won't be buying dragons and that's true <laughs> stuff you don't need. You have one theme, one story. You know what you're looking for, and at goodwill. And yeah, be smart yeah, enough uh, to know what you and, need and what you want. We know the difference. Right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> was, we were watching Niall's video on YouTube the other day. They have a, a mini series on YouTube, and they said before they go to Transworld, they actually have all of their rooms designed and they know what they're going for, which I know I would not. There's no freaking way. They have a shopping list. But that's crazy. So like having the storyline helps with that. And then you're not just buying the random stuff. And then like Brian said, you you got this dragon and then you have nothing else that goes with the dragon. And in reality, you're spending more money because now you got to make things that go with them. So. Or you see it on Facebook Marketplace or Facebook group. I'm selling this $30,000 prop for Mm -hmm. 20 yeah so, yeah and we've seen on. an asylum haunt or well a haunted house in a real insane asylum use dinosaurs inside the asylum yeah like the real six thousand dollar moving dinosaur costumes unless he's I a time was... traveler or something you know <laughs> right? it, kinda... it, it was not utilized that way they so. also had clowns and jason and you know yeah, it was, yeah. but you know that <laughs> i know a lot of people don't like to use asylum themes sometimes but it's, you know, it, especially when you have a building like that. Like, if you have one of those old, creepy buildings, create a story from it. Like, a lot of haunts even say they're really haunted, and sometimes they are. But, I mean, it, do you have this haunted? Because that piques that interest again. It makes people wonder, like, what's going on in there? Like, Dent Schoolhouse. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, I don't know if their story is actually real or not. But they've done yeah. good enough at, at, you know, filling in all the blanks and using... Oh, you know, it's the dance schoolhouse. So it's obviously Charlie, the janitor of the schoolhouse is the icon character. Like, okay, was there actually a Charlie that was a janitor at the school? Like, and we if, don't know, but you, there might be. You find news articles and stuff that like Dent has put out there, but then there's other ones too. And it's like, don't I don't know, know it, but it, it might it, be real. It, it, makes it might it be creepier, you know? Or it might just be extra work that Dent's done to and help fill in their story. We, right. yeah, <laughs> we asked him several years ago and he was like, I don't know, maybe it is and maybe it's not. And to this day, we still don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that, like, that's like, uh, not Statesville, but the other one. Uh, Hellsgate. Uh, Hellsgate. He created it around the whole story about the, the mysterious haunted house that you yes. you get a free ticket or you get it's free if you can make it through or whatever and mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that was created just around a story right Absolutely. exactly so. and a lot of people when they saw that i mean people over by us were like did you guys see this new haunted house because it hit all of those boxes of something that somebody was looking for already so it's wild um but our next area is the scare factor, which is how scary an attraction is. It's got to be scary. <laughs> it's got to be scary for it to be at the next level. Scary, you know. scary <laughs> is catching you off guard, um, leaving you walking around we, corners wondering like what's going to be next, what's going to happen, where did that actor go? As far as scare types, we've actually got mm-hmm. a whole podcast episode over on our podcast of just about different scare types and different techniques and things like that. There are so, a lot. Like... Um, um, there's double taps, there's, which is, you know, you know, scares coming right at, you know, back to back. I one after the your other. great attractions are the ones that are more, more so utilizing the double taps. So um, a good example of what we mean by a double tap is you have an actor that's in your drop down window and he drops the window and it makes a sound. So he comes out and he's like in his mask and it goes boom and then roar. And then if you have that light or and sound going with it, if those are timed the right way, 
it may get someone in the group and someone else again with different things. So like the sound may get them once and then him coming out the window may get them again. But sometimes you can get a quadruple tap, which is not really seen much at all. Except for panels on either side or if you've got an actor in the scene distracting. Or he's got one of those shakers. And when you think he's not going to do anything and he's getting ready to put his window back up, he shakes it and you get those double, triple, I mean... We see um, actors that can, there was, we went to blood prison two, two years ago, and there was one actor in a room that got four scares in a single room, four scares out of our group of avid haunt goers, all using four different things in his room in one walkthrough. So he had, he got our group four different times, which would be like that quadruple tap. Like you wouldn't think you put this actor in this room and he's going to get them here. But he was able to turn around and do this and do this and walk over here and do that. And he was able to do it over and over again very, very successfully. So I think for your haunt to be great at scaring customers, you've got to scare them when they're least expecting it, which sounds harder than, but distractions and doing the double taps. Like you scared me once. There's no way he's going to scare me again. But ah, he he did or he tried. Is there a Matthew, is there a reference to the scare types on your YouTube channel? Or is it it's just not me? on YouTube yet. Um, we do have it on our website. Uh, if you scroll down our homepage, just a few P, you know, a few bits there, you'll see a big podcast logo, big microphone. Uh, you click on that and it'll take you to our podcast page. And then uh, we've got all of our episodes listed there. And it's the one about uh, types of scares we actually have a um an article well, it's not really an article but we have a google doc in our drive where we we share it with our review teams to show them all the different types of scares and if somebody wanted that we could just simply download it as a document and give it to you or if you would like it brian to put in the group or on the website or anything yeah, we'll post it uh, we'll post it in hunter's toolbox in the next few okay. days or so cool and if anybody would like to add to it because there's over 2500 haunted houses in america you know, we're surely missing something that we just haven't seen yet. So mm-hmm. feel free to add it to there or ask questions or anything you want to do. But um, so when you're scaring or setting up your haunt to scare, make sure that your actors know not to target uh, just one person. Don't always. Or just the front of the group or. Yeah. You know, it, it's super easy for uh, especially uh, amateur actors or greenhorns to um uh, you know, always try to get the the first person to come around the corner because that's where they're waiting is behind the corner. They're trying to get that first person. And uh, it's hard to wait for, you know, the third, fourth, fifth person because people are going to start picking you out and all that sort of thing. I get it. But, you know, also your scenes should be designed to give them ways to hide so they can wait for a later part of the group if they're able to. Um, but yeah, try to try to you know what your actors are doing throughout the whole house or at least in, you know, before and after yours um, so that you can be doing something different, going after a different part of the group or stalking the back of the group, you know, and not only which part of the group to scare, but where to scare them from. So some from the left, some from the right. Uh, above and below are two uh, commonly overlooked areas that mm-hmm. we find to be very effective. Yes. And uh, um from John LaFlamboy's teachings, mm-hmm. he tells a lot of people like guide their can, attention above because you naturally want to protect can, this area. You can raise the chin and get them looking up at something and then come at it from below or even just down low from the side even. And you don't have to get close to people and you don't have to touch them either. Like there are haunts that do that. We go to them a lot. Um, but that's not to say that they're scarier. Um, most of the times they are, if if they've been scored scarier, it's because they are utilizing 360 scares more often than others. So they're not just scaring like Tyler's saying from like elbow level from both left and right. They're scaring from all the way around us and they're using different types of scares. So just like your costumes and your characters and what they're doing and what they look like, you want to try to scare different ways. So throw that air blaster in there and then hit them at the ankles and then hit them from behind, like the air blast from behind if you want. Like use those, like not at the same time, but all throughout the attraction. And if you can't scare from above, just that simple air blast is coming from above and they're not expecting that to hit them in the, you know, right here on their head. And it scares your bravest customers. Like, you know, it's it's hard to scare Tyler. It's not very hard to scare me. I'm actually a scaredy cat. <laughs> um, but things like that, you can't, you don't know that it's coming. There's no way to know. So adding all of those things in there that you just don't see. Um, and real quick, this is kind of cast too, but one of the biggest things that we notice about cast and scares is it seems like a haunt or an actor is relying on the group to be scared of an actor, or be afraid of them 
when they walk in and they're visible and they just start talking to you and they may like slam their hand on the counter after you've walked in and they're in mid conversation. But in reality, we're not really sure why you were obvious in the first place. Like, could you hide or maybe you got off timed and you were just in the middle of the room, but it's generally an appearance that can scare us when you can. It's generally better if you're hidden and then you use a pop out to startle. Or yeah, there's to, a clear to, second you know, scare in the room. So like you're the distraction. We're supposed to be looking at you, but something happens over here. Yes. Yeah. If, if you're out in the room, you should be distracting for something else mm-hmm. most of the time. <laughs> I yeah. know everything's always different, but yeah, yeah, there should be a purpose of why you're already out in the room if that's what you're doing. But. And then as a designer, it's your job to create the room for the actor. To almost yes. make their job easy. Make mm-hmm. give them that so actor the hole, lighting, that the sound, hole. the textures, mm-hmm. the, the yeah. layout, and have spots for your actors to retreat in different spots and different corners. They can mm-hmm. work the room. It should be their playground. It should be, oh yeah, this can be fun. Yes. I can hide over there. I can hide over there. I can pop yes. over mm-hmm. there. I can climb up over right here. Mm-hmm. And, and even uh, like at the darkness when Larry was showing us his actor holes during Trans World last year, he had holes in the center of like four rooms where one actor would be in there and like a black cloak and they could set off different things in four different rooms that weren't even themed the same so like you don't see that actor but he's back there like basically running in circles doing things so when you build your haunted house like brian's saying don't block them in somewhere don't not give them space where they can move and do things we've seen some actors that could operate four or five six different effects right in a row and you would have no idea it was the same person doing it they've got a rope over here behind the corner and a button over here and they can trip a drop panel here and all you know trigger a prop across the room you know it's mm-hmm. Yeah. Give your actors like a little control room if you can get those little. Yeah. I don't have. I mean, my uh, like say I don't design haunts. I I haven't seen enough floor plans to know how to do it, but uh, I know it's possible because we've seen it done. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. And just 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 working basically with distraction, you know, whether yes. it's uh, just a little tiny movement or a little light, just right up there, and have the actor come from over here. Right? If you have yes. two actors, make sure that they're working off of each other, so mm-hmm. one can distract and scare, then they can take turns or. Mm-hmm. I love the lighting scares when they're hiding behind the light and we can't see them. That's that's a good one. And it works oh, in the yeah. swamps too. Mm-hmm. Vortex tunnels, the fog tunnels, mm-hmm. or the swamps. Illus- illusions are a little uh, underutilized also. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like even going back to some of the basics, like just Pepper's ghosts mm-hmm. and different things like that. And like some mirror tricks, you know, smoke and mirrors, that stuff's just cool. The, the disappearing floors, the floors that go on forever, like you're on a yeah. break. Those yeah. are cool, but they're tough to keep clean. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You can tell. Oh, that's light. Mm-hmm. Down there. <laughs> and after yeah. you sweep it off so many times and it kind of scratches the plexiglass <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's. Yeah, we see some are <laughs> still using those now yeah. that, that probably need to be retired because it's obviously not what it's supposed to be anymore. <laughs> but. The, the walls cool. tend to work a little better, I think, yeah. as far as being able to stay cleaner just because they're vertical and not a catch all. But yeah. Right. Um, so after the haunt, after um, the we want to reiterate. Keep oh, it, no, 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 no. Oh. Finale. Oh, I'm going to skip finale. Can't miss that. So for everybody knows first impressions are great mm-hmm. and you got to have those that, you know, when you first get in, take a booth, immersion, start building those first impressions. But I would say equally, if not more important, is your last impression, which we're going to call your finale. And the finale is the last scene before you walk out of the haunt. And, you know, ideally you would have something ramping up to that, kind of like a movie. You know, there's a crescendo, except for, um, like, a lot of movies, you know, have a little wind down after the after the the big finale or the climax of the movie to kind of wind down. But for haunts, like, you want something... It should be like your most high intensity scene or something that's going to be sending folks out of there running, screaming their heads off because you want to have that. You want to get those juices flowing right before you dump them back out into the midway area in your gift shop. And because while those juices are flowing, that's kind of the segue into uh, what you should have after the haunts and ways that you can keep them on site or capitalize on those feelings that they're going through Mm -hmm. after having that awesome finale. Um, you know, have, have number one, have some kind of gift shop, have some way to capitalize on that, you know, sell them some photos or t-shirts or swag gifts, you know, souvenirs, Mm -hmm. have something, give us some way to take a piece of the haunt home with us. Give us an end way or back to your midway instead of just dropping us off out into a random parking lot. We we have literally, I know Nora was going to tell this story. We have been to a haunt that had 
three attractions. Mm -hmm. um, and after you got out of the first one, the first attraction, mm -hmm. it dumped you into the parking lot. But not the parking lot you parked in. Yeah. So it was like a random parking lot. And we're standing there looking around like, okay, where yeah. do we go? We didn't know this. There was no signs, no staff, no anything. Take a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, no, nope. right. That's what we were thinking. Yeah. And then a group come up behind us and we're like, do you guys know where to go? And they're like, yeah, you have to go back around to the front of the building where you came in to go downstairs to go to the two other attractions. And we're like, we're assuming they had been there before oh. because nobody told us that. And like, Even a sign would be there. nice. No something. sign. No nothing. Something. I don't know how many people are on the ground. Or, I don't know something. how many people are doing what we did and leaving. But down there in the basement where the other attractions were was also their big gift shop. Mm -hmm. So the sign would have to, like a big giant sign. Hell, I'd probably try to build like a walkway right there where yeah. people have to go. You, It's like cattle. <laughs> Guide them system. through the haunted house mm -hmm. and through the gift shop and past all the food and all those things if you can. People don't want to think. They don't want to think. They just want to be no, there. They, they, want to, they want to move. Mm -hmm. They want to buy their and stuff. You think, and... you think they have common sense, but just pretend like you're selling it to the four-year-old. That's like yeah. the best way to think of it. <laughs> I guess uh, even us as reviewers, like, we don't want to think about where to go. We, you know, well, we, 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 so we want excited. to. We don't. We, like, we, we want to think you know. about the haunt and start decompressing and, you know, or debriefing, I should say, and start talking about what we just experienced and putting our heads together, not how to get to point B, you know. Mm -hmm. so. And we don't score on whether you have food, drink, concessions, and things like that, but we highly recommend that you offer them. We just went and to our first official during season haunt last weekend and it was almost 90 degrees in there those poor actors but they were giving them water very frequently mm -hmm. and when we come out we were sweating and wanting water but they don't sell anything there so we all walked to the convenience store next door and purchased our drinks and stuff so and just, if it had been cold we'd have probably wanted some cider we would have had a cooler <laughs> of dollar water hell i probably would have paid five dollars for a water at that moment to right. keep myself from walking down the street like for right. real yeah. think about that like even if you're just putting up a little table with some stuff you don't know how many people will buy it until it's right there and i think it's worth a try at least even if it's hot dogs and soft drink or, or chips and soft drink something you don't need a license for well you've whatever, got like. water probably on staff in, or on hand anyways for your actors so mm -hmm. get extra and sell it to the customers you don't have to give it to them if it's bottled water i mean they, they might pay for it they might be okay with that so going back to your finale what are some of the typical finales you see i know chainsaw is a popular <laughs> I, I was gonna say i think uh, you know that chainsaws. answer and i want to say something about that real quick mm -hmm. so if you have a chainsaw actor as your finale um, think about the times you've seen him or her chase people way down the street somewhere and five groups come out the haunt after that and they don't have the chainsaw actor yeah. because he's chasing somebody else mm -hmm. um, so we recommend at least two or something else there that's entertaining slash scaring them stick another two one or two q actors out there that can rotate and keep chasing guests after they you know chase, they can keep chasing the runners but um, get the main guy yeah like a room. like a handoff system you know like yeah the, yeah you know Pass them off. yeah mm -hmm. you, yeah, you don't you yeah, don't want yeah. people to go, oh, we missed the chainsaw guy, even if they're tired of seeing chainsaws, mm. because they're very common. It's still different when you come out and you don't get it. Like when you know it's supposed to be there, but you missed it. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, if you're like, I feel like I got a little ripped off right there, even though I may not have wanted see it. see chainsaws but... all the time, but Nora's still petrified of them. It took me about three years to break her of just bolting whenever she heard a chainsaw start up, you know? <laughs> and when everyone's like really good and just right on her and won't leave her alone and they're going nuts, like flying off the handle, she'll eventually take off running. Um, so we've like also it. seen... um larger vehicles that come after us like on trails and stuff mm -hmm. we've seen like some of your um i think they're gorgalor like the race um costume some of the big uh oh i forget what they're big called big scare scare animatronics where you wear well, them on your shoulders and the they got costumes. the arms that yeah you know. yeah so not the animatronics but just a costume one. Oh, just the yeah. costume yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so like if you have a stilt walker they might work as your finale if you don't like it, make it something different than what's in the rest of your attraction so make it seem like more extreme or just different sometimes will work too but like tyler said you prefer for them to be scared when they come out like right when they come out and they're going to remember that more than they remember a lot of other stuff too. And if it's something that's a big and wow thing, like even like, cause like we're not naive, we know not everybody's going to get scared, but they're, they should at least go, 
oh shit that was cool you know when when they come out you know give them something to remember we've been chased by a horde of zombies before when i say horde we're talking maybe five um but it's but there was no other room with five actors in it so it worked out really well because it was just different than everything else so a really good finale or finale sequence can make up for a lot inside the haunt you know because they're like oh damn that end was you know it's still ending on a high note you know if you are going to send them out running make sure that's a safe area the, but about the worst yeah. thing you can do is like like say either having the chainsaw guy that's missing or have us come out and wondering Wonder to ourselves was. was that it yep so some haunts are a lot of haunts i guess like stopped, you said like, a lot of haunts are doing the actormatronics they're big they're scary they work they move so it makes them more unique than just the prop that does the same thing over and over so we do see those we see double taps from those so we get like a snake on this side and a snake on that side or maybe different types of animals or those those work great for haunts that can't utilize those things and can't afford these six thousand dollar actomatronics um do do something different there um use that sound to your advantage like you could put a black hallway there you could and with using i know tyler's like but using the right kind of sound if you build the right amount of suspense as they're walking through there to make them wonder what or when something's going to happen even a simple scare there could be built up more than the rest of the haunt just because of the way you made them feel we did have i do remember a finale of a haunt that was just a pitch black tunnel i couldn't even tell that the walls were black it was just no light like they could have been white walls and i would have thought they were black and even still, he filled the room with fog. And then every once in a while, just like a strobe light would go off. But then mm -hmm. while it was pitch black, like he played the heartbeat sound and the, you know, the subwoofer and just this feeling of dread. And the idea was that he was simulating that you had died. You know, mm -hmm. you know like the finale was back here in this last scene. And then this was what death was like before you finally walked out the end. And, you know, just something. But it's hard to it. It wasn't like a simple just walk out. You had to feel your way out because yeah, you couldn't see you know? like and, and for every step you took, you might have thought you'd have been walking into a wall like you literally couldn't see your hand in front of your face. It was mm -hmm. very well done. For the most part, though, they were just a black room. room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen some of the kill, kill, kill another character. Like, um, like one character was like the main character, and you see them at the end, and they're doing like this crazy thing. Like a final boss fight type of big epic finale thing. I can't, you know. Yeah. Mm. So give them something to remember, something that's... Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And then out there in that after haunt area, your end way or your midway, give them plenty of things to take pictures of with your haunt logos on them. Photo ops, advertising. video ops, if yeah. you can afford it. Mm -hmm. um, all the merch and concessions. Give us something to remember in the haunt and then give us something that we can take home and remember the haunt. And <laughs> if you can, ask them what they thought about it. Like, I know a lot of people come out and they go, "It's good. it was good, and they just keep on walking. Um, some haunts are doing surveys. See if you can get them to fill that out. Tell them it's a chance to enter free tickets for next year or whatever it is it's that you'd like way, to do. It's the best time to get a video testimonial, too, of customers. That's that true. Yeah. Really yeah. Like but them. if you can get them to fill something out, then you get their email. And now you are. Email or a phone number. Or a phone number, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what we see a lot of escape games in these areas, games, axe throwing, all kinds of stuff to keep people on property. We're seeing now and now that a lot of customers, they go through the haunt and then they go wandering around trying to find something else to do. So I think they're a lot of them are trying to make a night of it and they're trying to have like this all encompassing entertainment at one place. So create a space that allows them to do that your haunt mm -hmm. if possible if you have the real estate to do it mm -hmm. yeah that's the bulk of it anybody want to ask questions or elaborate on anything we got or are we out of time or what, where are we at right well we ran 21 minutes we were, over. yeah we were 21 <laughs> minutes over we still have <laughs> people that hung around with us the strong <laughs> the few. yeah the we need crowd. to make a strong note actors to, um, <laughs> we need to make a note to give brian the uh, the document for the the types yes. of scares that we have somewhere. Yep. so anybody wants that i will post it in the honors toolbox um sometime this week so if you're not mm -hmm. a member that's on facebook honors toolbox facebook group and i'll put it over there um now that was good um because i know when uh 
you guys came through ours. It wasn't you specifically, but it was a team right. of yours. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had some actor that was, he had some kind of movie mask or something. I don't know where he got it from. It wasn't really? issued. It was like something he grabbed. I'm like, <laughs> I think it was like, it might have been Texas Chainsaw Mask or, mask or something. I was like, oh, where did that come from? Who had that on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so always make sure communication with your actors is good. Um, yeah, and just giving your customers a, an experience, you know, whether it's, and I tell my actors, if you can't scare them, I know the big thing, if you can't scare them, entertain them, um, they're there, they're there to get a show. They want to, they want to see their friends be scared. You know, they want to remember things and want things to take home with them. As long as you're putting the emphasis on being scared though, because if you just want to be entertained by live actors, I can go to a dinner show. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> try to be scary first and like if you're if you're getting groups that like are just harder to scare like do a little bit of entertainment but still always be trying to get those jabs in still, still trying to be getting have, scared have tricks like, up your sleeve like maybe the death whistle maybe you have it in your pocket and they don't know you have it and you've tried to scare them and it didn't work sneak up behind them a little bit and blow it not right in their ear not real close to them but you know blow it maybe when they get even to the door on the other side of the room and maybe right. they'll be like oh shit you know because it'll it'll get us so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and don't be annoying to customers. There's a, there's a certain right. point where you want to stop. Yeah, if you're a screamer, one one scream is oh, enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is that one of your pet peeves as a screamers? Yes. Sure. Yes, because it's annoying. Screaming for no reason. And especially when there's like five of them screaming at the same time, like I'm getting a headache just thinking about it. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's it's not. It makes you want to wear earplugs. Mm-hmm. Kind of takes just, you out of the environment too, because it's not. It's, yeah. Someone's being chopped up on the table. Okay. But if you just got girls in a morgue that are screaming at you. Yes. And even if they're being chopped up on the table, like eventually they need to die. Yeah. <laughs> like, Stop screaming. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's what we <laughs> went one of the haunts that opened up for media night here about three weeks ago. They had this victim that was, you know. Uh, being becoming a sacrifice for a cult, and she was like, "Are you gonna help me?" Help me? And started screaming, and one of the other actresses acted like she is smacking her on the face with a book. Yeah, knocked her out. I'm like, "Thank yes. you." <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. It's okay to be victims and screaming, but not like you know, like Tyler saying, "There's there's an end." Like we get what you're doing, we get what you're who you are now mm. now what happens like, right mm. so any other pet peeves oh god we could go on forever there's a whole episode there's a whole podcast there is an, i remember on, that one yeah there's, there's several i think there's two or three yeah. i think it's an annual thing we've done a pet peeves episode. Kind of thing um, like, i don't i don't like the one where actors are over scaring and the customer is bald in a corner and the actor just keeps no. going there out. is a point to shut it off yeah, yeah, yeah. they're not in a, they're not enjoying that at that point and you mm-hmm. regardless of scaring them or not you want them to enjoy it and screaming and bawling is yeah just no, no. you want them to enjoy it enough to come back and if you yeah. are to the, that point you're probably traumatizing them and they are not going to go back nor are they going to recommend it you know we don't get to it's, see that that much because when they when they pair us with customers um usually they usually they, take off they without us yeah yeah so we we're we're with them with for like four scenes and then they're gone so because <laughs> we don't want to run through the haunt you know so because we'll miss something and then you guys will get mad at us for missing it and not talking about it <laughs> so, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you, you're stuck Pet with me. us walking through slow we probably covered a lot of them because we were telling we probably did. kind of going over what you should do or what what we think mm-hmm. we should see right. you know but i'm i'm the sure. overused phrases is one that's a big one no. we just so much you like you will be in this really good haunted house and just one simple get out can ruin it we've we've had some Not having hunters. enough actors can be one too. yeah that we, could be we've been to some beautiful haunts that had hardly any actors and it's like Ugh. or the ones they had you know. just stood there like very rarely is it really good for an actor to just stand there or just sit there we've seen them sit before too like we walked into a kitchen one time and an actress was sitting on the counter with her hands like this and she just stared at us as Mm -hmm. we walked by and it wasn't like a creepy stare it was just like a I hate that I'm here right now, so I'm just going to sit here. Mm-hmm. And I get that, you know, we we also talked about variety of scares. Creepily staring can be a type of scare, but it doesn't have to be all that they're doing, too, you know. 
Well, and her sitting there staring, by the time we got midway through that room, all she had to do was kick that cabinet beneath her and just yeah, say give her something. Wooden spoon or something. Right, right. <laughs> That's all she had to do, <laughs> you know, but she just sat there. Mm -hmm. um, another pet peeve is um, actors come out of their costumes. They Pulling their mask up. Pulling their masks up so like here, when they think that nobody's coming. Um, and this is kind of a design problem sometimes too, because sometimes there are no triggers to let these actors know when a group is close to them. So a lot, you know, sometimes you see like the holes in the walls or there's a specific sound in this room ahead of you. So when you hear that, you know, a group is about a second from you. Yeah. You can you know? set up your triggers to to change the room sound too. And when an actor knows that a a mm -hmm. sound change next door. Oh, shit, there's somebody coming. You know. It's really loud. They're probably going to need some kind of light or you could use your lasers and stuff for that type of thing, too. But I would think it would be getting expensive at that point. But if very... it's just us walking through, we might be walking through quiet and not We're... saying anything. And, you know, like, we could sneak up on somebody pretty That's easy. That's very rare for me. I'm usually pretty talk. Mm, right. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if we're filming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm a yeah. pretty talk. <laughs> we used a... Uh car alarm in the dark maze was dark maze was probably about oh. not quite the halfway but almost so probably zone one two three four and five so right there after zone two is it like right there right there after you get out of the dark maze it's mm -hmm. and so everybody in the hall could hear it so everybody within that zones three four and five they had no reason not to be where they're at <laughs> yeah. right in the, in yeah. the first two zones um there's an animatronic prop or something that went off. We had a drop panel in the hallway. So they those were sound cues, too. So everybody, that's what first thing I say is, okay, here's your sound cue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and here's where you need that's to be standing. Okay. So when they come in the door, they can see. Yeah. Now, this yeah, this that's... spot over here is available. You can mm -hmm. do that once you get used to the you get used to the room. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, definitely using those cues. Mm -hmm. <clears> yeah, that's very important. That helps spots. with your timing and everything. Yeah. Everything. Well, um, it's almost 9.30. Is there anything else you guys would like to add about creating the perfect haunt? The, the I'm sure haunt, we're haunt. forgetting something. As soon as oh, we, we get can, off here, we'll remember we, something. We can go on for hours and hours and hours yeah. talking about all the little tweaks and changes. And with and different ideas haunts, too. And, you know, like your hay rides are a lot different. And, mm -hmm. yeah, trails. and As far as general ideas that should be able to be applied to most haunts, I think we we covered a good chunk of it for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if any haunts have any questions about how they were scored or what we score on or anything like that, just shoot us a message. You can shoot us privately a message if you want. You can email the scarefactor at gmail.com. Um, you can shoot us a message on Facebook. Um, our team, our review team is Team Zombies. So, I mean, you can email us there or message us there or whatever you'd like to do. Um, we're always open to answer questions. If you think that we need to look at something that we're not, you know, tell us that. We're always, we want to learn too, you know. And if you're curious, like what our score sheet questions are and like you want to maybe study and try to figure out what exactly we're looking at. And if you, if you reverse engineer some of those questions, you can tell a lot. Um, about what we're looking for too but all of our score sheets are available on any of our reviews and so if you go to any of our uh, 2022 reviews for example down at the bottom of the last category there's a button that'll let you expand the full four sheet the full score sheet <laughs> and that is like literally what we uploaded to the website and got your scores from and it's the full breakdown with all the math and and all that good stuff so. and they're weighted too so it's not like some categories are worth more than others and so, and so yeah like scare factor and actors mm -hmm. and customers are you know so we tried to figure out how to put more emphasis on different things because you know yeah, I'm going to go down another rabbit hole. I don't watch so, it. <laughs> it's all available and you, you can find it on the website. Can anybody add their haunts to scarefactor.com? Home yes. haunts? We're absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, just okay. go to the contact us tab on there and there's a button for directory listings and uh, that'll give you a form you can fill out whether you're adding a new listing or wanting to update an existing listing. You, you can do it all right there. For so. home haunts, um, we do ask that they have a Facebook or Instagram or website to link to. And that's only so that we can go back next year and make sure that they're still active because for us, it's easier for us to just see that on a page. Um, so if you don't have any kind of page, we usually ask for one. 
But if you want customers, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, then you should have at least one of those presences and creating a Facebook page is easy. It's free. Mm-hmm. Um, so we definitely want a link at least. We prefer one. Where mm-hmm. Perch comes to shove, we can technically deal with an email, I think, but yeah, you know, because that's at least some way that we can follow up and and see what's mm-hmm. going on. But yeah, we we prefer that you take the initiative and, and have your information out there first, and then that gives us a way to keep our stuff updated. But, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Dan's off here now, but his haunt was a Silent X. A Silent X. I saw that. We, uh, we do have teams in Arkansas this year that are going to be in and out. So we'll we'll see if either of them are. I can't remember if we have a Silent X on the. We keep a review request sheet going. I know um, in your post in the group, someone else was saying that we couldn't get to the Haunted Hollow, maybe. But he's on the review request list. We haven't forgotten about them. We just haven't had anybody get there. Um, we'll be going to darkness this year, but I, they're like two hours from the darkness. I just don't think it's possible. But Asylum X yeah. is on our review request yep. list. So. It sure is. We have not forgot about them. <laughs> yeah, he's a uh, first, uh, say, second year, maybe. So. Okay. Heck yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, um, Scarefactor.com for everything. It's the on Scarefactor.com, media. just to clarify. <laughs> the Scarefactor. The Scare we did try. If, if yeah. you just type in Scarefactor without the the, you will get some kind of spammy thing. We've been trying to buy that website for years, and every time we ask, they raise the price, and I, I, I can't we do can't it. We can't get it. They want <laughs> like six grand for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but yes, the scarefactor.com or at the scarefactor on all the social medias on YouTube. Uh, and in addition to review requests, we're also taking filming requests. So several of, of our teams are uh, expanding into video coverage and doing like some POV walkthrough style videos uh, for the YouTube channel. And a lot of our viewers are really loving those. And we, believe it or not, like I know some haunts may think that like it's giving everything away or showing off the, you know, giving away the haunt but like we've had a lot of customers that we've crossed paths with at the haunts that we're going to and saying your video convinced me to come here so like uh, well, i think it's another great way that we're seeing to to help bring more exposure to haunts and, and help convince people to go so mm-hmm. i know you pop up a lot whenever i'm searching for things we're trying to do do that and have good seo on google because i know a lot of people are like nobody uses your website they use google and i'm like they do use our website they used google to find it they just didn't realize i was showing brian our stats earlier i I think they do use it but it's okay (laughs) yep they read the reviews too yes they do (laughs) yes they do i'll be following your stuff over the season because i can't get to all the haunts that you do so i'll be uh living vicariously through you guys (laughs) we appreciate it that's what we we do do. it for so we do (laughs) all right well uh, thanks everybody for hopping on tonight Mm -hmm. um thanks guys for sharing your your behind the scenes and what you look for so absolutely thank you for having us on we'll be happy to come back anytime yeah. All right. We'll talk about something else next time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to sign off and have a good season. All right. You do the same. Thank All you. All right, guys. <laughs> good night. Good, good night. night. This podcast episode sponsored by Scarret Badges. Get your Scare Badges at scarebadges.com. Also sponsored by Haunter's Toolbox. Take your haunt to the next level at haunterstoolbox.com. Thank you for listening to Haunt Topic Radio. Please leave a comment wherever you found this podcast. Each comment you leave will help spread the word to other haunters around the world. See you next time.